I just wanted to say hi. You oh, haven't talked to Linda in a while, David. No, I have not. Not in a little while. <laughs> hi, how hey, are baby. you? How is she doing? <laughs> I'm doing well. I just got home from teaching all day. Hi, Linda. Hi. hi. It's good to see you. Yeah, you too. It was a long hey. day. I'm teaching middle school English now, so it's a long day. I bet. How many <laughs> students? I have about 70 7th and 8th graders. Ah! Oh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You are an angel. <laughs> I'm kind of my zone. I kind of like it. I don't feel like I ever really emotionally matured beyond that age. So I can't. <laughs> it's tough teaching right now with COVID, but um, I bet. I mean, I'm staying healthy and yeah. Anyway, you my daughter a conference tonight. My daughter um, has been a public school, middle school teacher in Orange County, California for 26 years. Oh, wow. wow. You wouldn't Lord, believe Orange it. County. I mean, she has so many students. Uh, it's 40 per times four, so 160. She sees 160 oh, wow. kids a day. I went in there one day and taught an astronomy lesson and was exhausted after one day. <laughs> She's amazing. I'm out, I said. <laughs> I like it. I love my content. I love teaching English, and I teach at, like, a freshman and sophomore level. So I'm teaching, like, Romeo and Juliet and oh. To Kill a Mockingbird and um, John Steinbeck. And, you know, I, I try to teach. I try to raise and elevate the curriculum. So I really like Good for that. you. That's what she does, too. She's a really good English teacher. And... If the kids are talking with each other and they ask her a question, she was just saying the other day, she goes, don't ask me if you're going to fill it with pronouns. Too many pronouns. Come on, put the real thing in there. <laughs> I'm going to launch Romeo and Juliet tomorrow, as a matter of fact. I'm nice. That, so. yeah. <coughs> okay, I'll let you guys get back to work. Thank you. Bye. Well, Bye. Good, see you, Linda. Good job. Bye. Good job. Thank you. <laughs> Like 13 planets in the solar system, and I'm over here, like, oh my gosh, someone save her. <laughs> She's like, they they made a Pluto uh, official planet, and she had all her facts wrong. She was, she was like, oh no, it's like the opposite of what it actually is. There's seven planets, well, there's 14. <laughs> She's like, no, there's eight million. <laughs> made me mad and I was over there face pump face palming myself I'm like she's a science teacher she's she's over here telling us that there's 13 planets in the solar system and Pluto and Pluto was an official dwarf planet in 2003 she was <laughs> cute I was face palming myself I was Ryan Hannahoe is going to join us next week, and um, uh, Kelsey Poor will join us next week. Mm. And we're really, really close to publishing Skies Up. Mm. Yeah. I hear we had a very successful um, Asian star party last weekend. We did. It was really cool. Um, um, it was, uh, gosh, that star party, let's see what the uh, current stats are on it. It's always kind of fun to look at that. Um, 28,150 people were reached. Um, let me see.
How long did the star party go on for? I had to leave after after the first part, but um, it went on for quite a while. <laughs> it would go on for like four hours, do you think? Oh yeah, uh, four hours and twenty two <clears throat> minutes and six seconds. <laughs> okay, and I would like to say that I think approximately four hours and twenty two minutes and six seconds <laughs> after the Asian star party called, yeah, uh, and ended, the uh, federal election was called. Almost oh, wow. at the same moment. Yeah. We had 7,600 views of that star party. People were, they were just so tense. It was almost, <laughs> and they were so it, tense from the election. It was, it was like, it you was, know, break. We're going to watch yeah. it. It was the first uh, pan-Asian star party. To our knowledge. At least that's what Christopher Go thinks. He's a pretty These smart guy. Star parties are truly global, which is a really wonderful thing. Yeah. <clears throat> Sometimes I'll take my telescope in the backyard and my dog will come out with me. He's a husky. And I'll be like, I'll tell my mom, I'll say, even astronomy is for dogs. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> well, you haven't introduced your dog to us yet. You've introduced the cat, but not the dog. Yeah, uh, my dog, his name is Milo. He's a little bit more. He's not allowed upstairs. <laughs> Trust me, he'd be sitting right behind me. He'd be, he, he's big and yellow. He's a, uh, he was my brother's dog, but my brother, he had a bunch of cats. So they didn't really get along. So he lives with us now. <laughs> the dog, not my brother. <laughs> my brother's like, my brother has an apartment, and they're like, you can't own a giant dog and live in our apartment. <laughs> so he owns two cats. So we currently, in our family, we have two dogs, three cats, and two fishes. <laughs> Where did the fish fit in? Yeah. Sounds crowded. My cat has a stroller and she'll sit out in the yard with me and do the shawmy. She'll sit right next to me. The last cool. What? My cat's okay. actually learning something. <laughs> I think it's cool. I'm like astronomy is for everyone, even the cats. <laughs> Dogs, fish. Yeah, I had a dog uh, in the past that when I used to go observe outside of the backyard, he would go and lay down underneath the uh, the ladder and sleep there, <laughs> taking care. But he was always kind of pissed off when I moved the ladder every once in a while to change objects. Say, hey, hey, what are you doing? <laughs> yeah, they're good company for observing. just sit there and she's not she won't bark at me like my dogs are crazy but my my cat is like calming so mm -hmm. she'll, she'll meow once if there's a little if there's a car coming by but other than that it's it's really peaceful mm -hmm. well i had a cat once and i had him up on the roof with me and i was watching the shuttle re-enter the atmosphere and it was so bright that the cat looked up to see it <laughs> so that, that was that bright. Wow. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Me and my dad have been wanting to take my 10 inch out, far out, like in the country, to go do a drama. We have only done planetary stuff for now, but we want to do a drama the galaxy.
we had questions um, from the Global Star Party because uh, uh, why is it so difficult to make a German equatorial mount uh, that would reach the zero degrees latitude, okay? Um, you can make one, but the problem is, is that, and this would be a good problem for, for Norman to comment on, but. I don't do equatorial. <laughs> Yeah, don't do equatorial. That's no, right. No, no, no. But, but an equatorial, an equatorial, yeah. you're trying to hit a, a point where it would balance on the tripod, right? Yeah. So you got you got the telescope and you got the counterweight, and you want yeah. to find the center of gravity, mm -hmm. balance right over the top of the tripod. You lean yeah. it over all the way over to zero, and what happens? Yeah. You know, you're either pushing the mechanics too far out. So now the tripod is wants, to, yeah, tripod right? wants to fall, fall off. fall over, right? Yeah. You need a over. huge you need a huge platform underneath. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. That's right. Mm -hmm. So you could That's have like this goal. tall pier so that you yeah. could clear, you know, and so and the other problem is the counterweight itself not hitting the tripod. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Not, not user friendly. <laughs> It's not user friendly. That's true. No. no. Yeah, Alt S is more much way to go in yep. uh, at that oh, kind yeah. of range. Oh yeah. And Alt S yeah. for many types of telescopes is really the the way to go. I would yeah. imagine. Oh yeah. Much simpler. If much. Only field rotators were cheap. Right. <laughs> yeah. And that's tricky. Um, I, I deal with the, the several big scopes that have um, Altas mounts and D rotators, and that's a whole nother. That is a whole nother deal. Complexity and failure. And, you know, then you get up to the zenith and you're trying to track something across the zenith, and the rotator has to be able to turn effectively instantaneously. Yeah. Right. It, that's a, that's a whole nother can of worms. So there's no perfect mount, period. No, it depends what you want to do. Exactly. Right. If you do imaging, of course, it's, that's another story. But for visual, I mean, Altas is just perfect. Or yeah, just because you yeah. don't have to deal with the field rotation. Yeah, but. yeah, exactly. <laughs> We've got. Uh, I think CCD can't. CMOS cameras may make that less of a problem because they will typically take many yeah. short exposures instead of one big long one. But yeah. Yeah. Even that is a problem because then, you know, the short exposures, if they're stacked in the camera, they're going to be the equivalent of one long exposure. No, but they have a program now that they, they cancel that movement. Yes. Uh, my, my friend here uh, does a lot of imaging, uh, Hugo, and then he was telling me he did some some imaging of, of Mars uh, lately, and then that's what the process. Oh, yeah, that's a whole and, other, yeah. It's like, woof. Fantastic. You can expect some amazing things in cameras in the next five years with wow. things like NVIDIA processors inside yeah. that can that can align things and stack them without yeah. having to transmit enormous volumes of data back to the computer. Exactly. Cameras are going to be much smarter in another few yeah. years. I, I, I tend to think that the, the cameras are going to get a lot more expensive, though, because I think we're going to move away from consumer-level cameras being converted to astro cams and you're going to have the numbers are going to go way down on the chips mm -hmm. it's going to get expensive for the chips even though you have all that horsepower like you talk about uh the yeah. chips are going to become much more expensive for for astro imaging i think yeah i don't know i'm not a big camera guy so no me neither i'm not i don't know I should mention that Ryan, I'll, I will absolutely be here next week because Ryan, I've known since he worked for Mike Rice at um, <clears throat> New Mexico Skies. And uh, when he went to Montana Learning Center, we gave him a bunch of ACP expert licenses so that he could support remote observing on multiple telescopes. And, oh. and they do that. And uh, Ryan is very sharp and he is really really done an amazing thing there uh, besides being a very good teacher which is what he went through school and became and did that he's an actually a very amazing person i i, I really think the world of ryan um, so i'll be here to cheer that. him on you know excellent well, i will second that i think ryan is one terrific person mm-hmm
And Bob, so are you, my friend. Man, I'm old, you know, I'm kind of like. (laughs) (laughs) But I'm here to kibitz. I think when you get old, you have a right to be, have your opinion and say what you want. Everyone has a right to their opinion. Oh, it's either so? going to be emotional <laughs> or logical. And depending right. on who receives it, they're going to receive it emotional or, uh, emotionally or logically. But it's all good. In April 2020, astronomers detected an unusually bright and powerful radio signal never before recorded in our home galaxy. The source is a magnetar, a type of compact object with the strongest magnetic fields in the cosmos. Like pulsars and neutron stars, magnetars are the crushed cores left behind when a massive star explodes, but their super strong magnetic fields put them in a class by themselves. The fields are up to a thousand times stronger than typical neutron stars, and over 10 trillion times stronger than a refrigerator magnet. They can rip molecules apart from thousands of miles away, distort the shapes of atoms, and store enormous amounts of energy. On April 27th, the magnetar, named SGR 1935, produced a rapid-fire storm of short, powerful X-ray bursts that lasted hours. The activity, first spotted by SWIFT, was also monitored by NASA's Fermi Gamma Ray Space Telescope, and the NICER X-ray telescope on the International Space Station, along with other space missions. As the storm wound down early on April 28th, NICER recorded some 200 X-ray bursts in just 20 minutes. Later that day, SGR 1935 fired off another X-ray burst. This time, though, it was accompanied by something new, a powerful pulse of radio waves lasting a thousandth of a second. Chime, A radio telescope in British Columbia, led by several Canadian universities, discovered the signal and determined it came from the vicinity of SGR 1935. Another experiment, called STAIR-2, and operated by Caltech and NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory, saw an even brighter signal at different radio wavelengths. Since 2007, astronomers have been trying to understand the sources of powerful millisecond radio signals called fast radio bursts seen from other galaxies. Magnetars have been prominent suspects. The duration and energy release of SGR 1935's radio signal is closer to fast radio bursts than any other source. For the first time, astronomers saw a magnetar in our own backyard produce a signal only previously seen in other galaxies. The discovery strengthens the case that magnetars are responsible for at least some fast radio bursts. Data from NICER and Fermi on X-ray bursts at the end of the storm showed that they differed from the one that coincided with the radio signal. This event's characteristics set it apart from the other eruptions, and further study may provide clues about how it also powered the radio burst. Radio waves from normal pulsars originate high above their surfaces. Exactly where and how, we don't know. A big eruption could launch a cloud of plasma to high enough that a radio burst could form. Never before have astronomers seen a fast radio burst so close to home. It's just one more reason to watch the skies and to keep tabs on the strongest magnets in the universe. Wow. I really enjoy those um, visualizations from NASA and Goddard Space Center. You know, they they just do some amazing stuff. It's it's great, and it's great that you know they're they're free to download and share. So if you're an educator, uh, you are uh, doing something like we're doing here uh, tonight with the Global Star Party. You know, for your own club, um, you know, that's definitely uh, a great resource. Um, if anybody out there needs. Uh, information on where to get some of those things, just let me know because I dig for them all the time. Uh, well, I want to welcome you all to the 21st Global Star Party. Um, it's, uh, uh, you know, it's amazing that we've done so many of these so far, but uh, 
Um, each one has been really fun, really special, and we've had great people on uh, and a great audience that watches from around the world. Um, tonight, uh, we uh, uh, start our program like we do uh, every Global Star Party, which is uh, a uh, introduction and a uh, uh, some words of wisdom and poetry from David Levy. Uh, David has uh, shared his love of the night sky, his passion of the night sky, the stars. Um, uh, he, is, he always seems to perfectly characterize uh, a great start uh, for our global star parties um, and uh, always makes me feel uh, uh, warm and, and uh, happy to uh, open these star parties because uh, no one does it like David does. Um, I also wanted to, you know, recognize David's uh, achievements. You know, he's discovered uh, over 20 comets. He's written over 20 books. Uh, he has written thousands of articles. Uh, he's done uh, online radio programs de devoted to astronomy. Uh, he's been interviewed on television, uh, documentaries. Um, you know, uh, he has uh, uh, given his gifts of, uh, of the, you know, his knowledge of astronomy and shared his discoveries with people all over the world. And uh, so it's great to have uh, David with us tonight. Um, uh, and uh, he's uh, 21 for 21 right now in, in the Global Star Parties. But uh, I think that, David, you mentioned that uh, since COVID has, has um, uh, been with us that you've done hundreds of uh, online lectures and presentations. Yes, indeed I have, and uh, I even have them all recorded here. Um, That's awesome. I've made a quote from my ma little magic book. Um, yeah, you're right, but I, I wanted to take a, this opportunity to say, Scotty, what a wonderful event the Global Star Party is. You've done them here in the Western Hemisphere, you've done them in Europe, and now we have one that we've done in Asia. Yeah. That is really very, very good. So good that uh, on, <clears throat> excuse me, on Saturday morning, after while well, that was going on, mm -hmm. they were about to call the election. They had de they had determined a victor of the presidential election. They were just about to call it when someone said, "Wait, the Global Star Party in yeah, Asia. Star we have to wait until that's finished." And so everybody <laughs> waited until it was finished. And then it was finally finished and they could call the election. Is that what and, happened? <laughs> yeah. No, that didn't happen quite that way, but it might as well have. It might as well have. Yeah. It was fun, though. It was fun. It was such a great star party. We had, uh, I'm going to show later in this in this program, uh, uh, some of the images of Jupiter that uh, were captured and some of the excitement of seeing uh, uh, Jupiter in such great seeing conditions. And the, Jupiter was like only about 30 degrees off the horizon. So um, <clears throat> it was really fantastic. So I'll, I'll have that later in this program. But uh, um, David, uh, what, after doing all these virtual events, after, I mean, you're a guy that has traveled all over the world to do star parties and uh, see eclipses and stuff like that. How do you feel about uh, doing all of this from uh, your den there? Um, you know, are you are you disappointed you can't get out, or, or are you happy that you're able to reach people around the world like this? Well, right now I am actually looking at the photographs or the images of um, eleven of the stars of tonight's global star party ranging from um, from bob denny uh down here to deep t from uh all the way across the world to libby who i've never met in person yet but who hails from your hometown that's Scotty, right that's and right. uh and all the others jerry hubble uh who uh thinks there's a space telescope named after you isn't there well, maybe, <laughs> but anyway, that's right. That's right. Oh, mine. Okay, it's all it's, mine. It's all yours. <laughs> yeah, which uh, brings a quick kind of an interesting question up to me. If this is my opportunity to give my little spiel, yeah. now, 
Sure. Okay, fine. Um, anyway, it brings that question up to, to mind. What is the most important telescope in the world? And I've asked that many times, and the answer ranges from the 200-inch at Palomar to the Hubble Space Telescope, and yes, yours, Jerry, to others. But to me, the most important telescope in the world is your first telescope. My first telescope is a three and a half inch reflector, which I've finally given up as I've gotten older and is now belonging to the Linda Hall Library of Science in Kansas City. And I'm really glad that it's going to get a renewed life there. It's the fall now. It is um, November. And a lot of us are having cloudy nights and a lot of us are having clear nights. We're having a clear night. And if you go outside tonight and look up, one of the things you will see will be the Pleiades. And that's just wonderful star cluster to look at. And of course, to me, it reminds me of one of my favorite poets, Tennyson, from whom I will quote tonight. But, <clears throat> but uh, I have to say that unlike almost everybody else here, from Libby to Dave Iker to Bob and to all the others, I am not a legal astronomer. I know absolutely nothing about astronomy. I've wanted to be an astronomer all my life, but I never was able to get the math. I was terrible at math and still am. A little better now than I was back then, but I was just terrible at math. What I loved and still love was the poetry, the other poets who have been able to over the years and centuries get into the uh, world of the night sky. Alfred Tennyson is one of my favorites. He owned a telescope, did you know? He owned, I think, a two inch refractor. And from the Isle of Wight, he was able to set it up and observe the night sky. And I'm sure one of the things he turned it to were the Pleiades. And he wrote in Locksley Hall, one of his most beautiful poems. Many a night I saw the Pleiades rising through the mellow shade, glitter like a swarm of fireflies tangled in a silver braid, blade. Braid. I figured I'd get that eventually. A beautiful, beautiful poem. <clears throat> but Tennyson wasn't just interested um, in, in observing the night sky. He also had a fabulous interest in theory and in the, the origins of the universe, which is something that Dave Iker is going to be talking about later on. I've always enjoyed listening to David's wonderful presentations, and I'm sure tonight is going to match some of those <clears throat> and or exceed some of those. <clears throat> but Tennyson loved to imagine the universe, the creation of the universe, the origins, and the ultimate fate of the universe. Will it expand forever or will it contract once more to become a single point of light? In Tennyson's time, we didn't know that. Now we suspect because of dark matter and dark energy that it will continue to expand forever. But Tennyson, uh, I wish I could sit down with him and ask him now uh, today what what he would what he would what he would do knowing what we know today tennyson did not know what we know today his great grandson jonathan tennyson who i do know and who i am a good friends with does know about that <clears throat> but in tennyson's most famous poem in memoriam he wrote the whole thing in 1850 it was published in 1850 he wrote the whole epic to celebrate the life of one of his best friends who died of a stroke when he was very young. And uh, he turned the, the elegy to, uh, to Arthur Hallam to <clears throat> a polemic about the universe and about nature, about um, evolution, about evolution both organic on Earth and in the cosmos. A cosmos. Anyway, uh, he writes in his final stanza about whether the universe will end as a, in a big crunch or in a forever expansion. Today, we think it will be a forever expansion. But in those days, the big crunch was a good possibility. And he ended the uh, poem in memoriam with that thought. 
that friend of mine who lives in God, that God which ever lived and loved, one God, one law, one element, and one far-off divine event to which the whole creation moves. And on that note, I would like to turn things back to you, Scotty. Thanks. Thank you very much, David. Thank you. Thank you. Well, that was beautiful. Thank you, David. Yes. That was beautiful. Thank you. <laughs> very nice. Very nice. That's right. <laughs> Heartfelt. Well, our, our next speaker is uh, David Eicher. Now, David starts his career. Uh, probably he, he, had, he had things going on before this, but he starts his career with, uh, with his Deep Sky magazine at age only 15 years old. I, I can't imagine too many other teenagers who had his act together as much as David did, uh, you know, and knew what he wanted to do. Once he once he starts his professional career at uh, uh, Astro Media, that's right. It's Astro Media. Is that right? Yes. He has this he has this meteoric rise, uh, successfully uh, becoming uh, uh, you know a greater editor than before. He's now editor in chief of Astronomy Magazine, and I believe that Astronomy Magazine probably has the world's largest circulation of any magazine devoted to astronomy. Um, it is, uh, uh, you know, informative, entertaining, uh, definitely a, a, a publication that you should subscribe to if you're in to the lifestyle of astronomy. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, Iker is also on the board of advisors or maybe directors of the Starmus event, um, uh, right? And so the Starmus event is probably the premier uh, astronomy event uh, that any astronomer would dream to go to or a astrophysicist would dream to go to. Um, uh, we're looking forward to that event happening in September of next year. Um, but uh, David also is uh, someone that has uh, uh, written many books. He's got over 20 books himself uh, devoted to astronomy. He's also a historian of the Civil War, uh, which is which is also very interesting because uh, you know David has a um, uh, the ability to uh, look back uh, and see how history has really shaped and carved our our present day existence. You know, which I I think is is uh, very interesting. Historians just have a way of telling a story and. Um, uh, David's going to share uh, yet another install of uh, the uh, universe with us tonight. And so, David, I'm going to give you the stage. Thank you, Scott, and thanks so much for, for doing this for all of us amateur astronomers in this very strange time. To hold these events really means a lot, I know, to, to all of us and to lots of folks who are watching. And David, Thank you again, as always, for entertaining us and for inspiring us. But uh, make no mistake, David Levy is a tremendous astronomer. And yeah, we know absolutely. that. Absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. That's right. I'll argue that point at some other time. But thanks, David. <laughs> um, tonight, in sort of moving out with these unusual tales of the universe, I wanted to talk a little bit about our closest celestial neighbor for a short time, the moon. How did the moon form? This is as people looked up at the moon, the brightest thing in the sky at night, uh, has been wondered about for a long, long, long time. And, and uh, it really is something that honestly, we don't know. We probably know, but we're not 100% sure about the origin of the moon, which is pretty fascinating. And there's some interesting details in this story. Well, the name moon goes back to about the year 725 from the Old English word mona, of course, which originated from the much earlier terms, the Latin term luna and the Greek term selene um, of the origin. Uh, but now its name, as we know, is the moon, literally its name. Now, a lot of people, even planetary scientists, will say, you know what, I was thinking about the Earth the other day, and I think, oh, you know, it's not the Earth. The name of our planet is Earth. You know, we don't say, I saw the Saturn in one of 
Scott's fantastic telescopes. <laughs> the moon's name, however, our moon is the moon. So there's an inconsistency there, but we wanna be careful with the terminology there. Well, for decades, it's been very clear that the moon has some oddities with regard to its relationship with us. It has a high degree of rotational speed, orbital speed, uh, its mass is very large compared to Earth relative to most moons. And strangely, the moon's uh, orbit is inclined about five degrees to the ecliptic plane, to the plane of the planets orbiting the sun. And, and its mass, uh, it, it's almost uh, referred to as a double planet, uh, often Earth and the moon. So the origin of the moon ideas, which festered for a long, long time, and nobody really had any great uh, evidence of which could be the, the answer, uh, sort of um, bounced back and forth between fission as an idea. That is, somehow the moon originated from Earth. Well, that was one idea. Another one was capture of an object that was simply captured orbitally uh, by Earth and orbited our planet, or this idea of co-accretion of the, of, uh, the moon and Earth uh, accreted, they formed out of smaller uh, bits, planetesimals building up together. But nobody really had any great ironclad evidence. In fact, there's a long heritage of thinking uh, that most lunar craters for many, many decades were volcanic, which they're not, of course. Along came uh, our old dear departed friend and close uh, companion and friend of David's, Gene Shoemaker, who invented the science of impact geology and uh, showed us that that was all wrong and that most everything on the moon, of course, reflects the early era of heavy impacts in the inner solar system. Uh, bless Gene and, and uh, we sure cer certainly miss him. He was a great, great scientist mm. and man. Mm. Well, things began to turn around after some of the fellows who Gene helped to train uh, went all the way to the moon and back between 1969 and 1972, and they returned 2,415 lunar rock samples. Uh, that, that was about 842 pounds of moon rocks came back to Earth. We now know later, of course, that some meteorites are lunar, but let's set that aside. The Apollo rock samples really constituted the major area of research on the origin of the moon. Their similarity to moon rocks, which we'll get to in a moment here, among other things, caused in 1975 a radical new hypothesis uh, from two planetary scientists in Tucson, Bill Hartman and Don Davis. They proposed uh, what, what came to be called the giant impact hypothesis that a large planetesimal body, when all these things were flying around in the inner solar system long, long ago, smacked right into Earth, threw up a ring of material which accreted into the moon. That would explain quite a large number of things as it turned out. Uh, some of those lunar mysteries, the rotational and orbital speeds, the large mass of the moon compared to Earth, uh, the inclination, of course, and something that was even more important as well. Scientists named this hypothetical body Thea. Uh, this is from the Greek word from mother of the moon, um, which is an appropriate thing. Uh, lots of studies went on, continued to go on uh, since the mid 70s up through the 90s on these moon rocks. And uh, there was sort of a renaissance, a rebirth of this, of investigating the details of what this proposed giant impact hypothesis would be from the planetary scientist Robin Knup. Uh, she became really the sort of leading uh, defender of this idea. And really the Apollo samples uh, produced their strongest evidence in the so-called isotopes, the flavors of some of these elements that are in crystals in moon rocks, oxygen and others are identical to earth rocks. Hmm. So the best way to explain that and also all of the orbital dynamics is from this collision of what was thought to be a Mars-sized body. And you think, well, where, what happened to this 
to fear them to this Mars-sized body? Well, the answer is mostly we're standing on it. Most of it, we believe, was absorbed into the proto-young Earth, that ring which existed for a few millions uh, of years, um, accreted then into the moon, and uh, which then continued to be battered, of course, by all the impacts. It doesn't have erosion uh, much uh, at all. Uh, compared to the many erosional forces on Earth. So we see that record, of course, in our telescopes of the battering that the moon took uh, in the late heavy bombard bombardment in the early uh, solar system. So we don't know absolutely, but the giant impact hypothesis of this early impact, there were lots of planetesimals, we think, in the early solar system, uh, protoplanets that were forming, all of the planets we think accreted, uh, certainly the terrestrial planets from material sticking together in the disk of the solar system. They mo some moved in and some moved out. There's been a lot of evolution of, of places in the solar system, but we believe that that is how the moon formed from this incredibly large impact. Interestingly enough, the New Horizons spacecraft, our pal Alan Stern, uh, heading that, uh, passing uh, Pluto in 2015, a few years ago, and studying the Pluto system, which has a, a one large moon, of course, Charon, which was discovered uh, at the Naval Observatory by Jim Christie, um, long after our pal, dear departed pal Clyde, uh, found Pluto itself. But uh, it also has some very small moons, and the idea from the dynamics looking at Pluto uh, is that it also suffered a major impact uh, that created that sort of double planetary system with Pluto and Charon and those very small moons as well. So where did the moon come from? We don't know. It probably came from that early impact. Uh, that's largely agreed upon, but it's not definitive among planetary scientists to this day. So that's the next strange tale stepping out a little bit farther into the universe and will go out a bit farther, I hope, in uh, successive weeks into the solar system and into the Milky Way and all the way out there to the end of cosmic time eventually. And if we solve all that, we'll, we'll uh, have really accomplished something. So Wonderful. thank you so much, Scott, and I hope that uh, <laughs> You know, when, when you're describing all this, I, I'm visualizing, you know, this yeah. crazy, chaotic, uh, you know, uh, 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 you know, ring of material uh, surrounding surrounding our planet and, uh, you know, just how hostile it must have been, you know. And the, the early solar system was a phenomenally violent place. And, and remember the old George Carlin routine that, you know, we think of what we're doing to the planet now. The planet's been through the late heavy bombardment. <laughs> the planet will be fine. It's are we going to be okay? <laughs> that's right. That's right. A lot of people talk about us hurting the planet. It's, it's going to be just fine. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> just fine. Um, I, I have a question for you too, uh, uh, David. The rings of Saturn, what are the thoughts of how long those rings will last? I mean, it's not, will, will, they, will they coalesce back down on the planet? Will they stay out there? What's the current thinking? That, that, that's an incredibly timely question about the rings of Saturn, which are blocks of ice from very small up to about house size. And there are a few of them that are thought to be larger yet, like very small hillocks or tiny mountains. But most of the ring, most of the particles that make up Saturn's rings are very small up to about the size of normal houses. We're at the right time in the universe to see Saturn's rings because it's probably, it's likely that a, a satellite, a very icy moon uh, broke up that could have been a, an, a discrete moon and created the, the rings, which are of course multifaceted and probably based on Cassini uh, data, which is, mm -hmm. new. you know, it's basically very new uh, in the, on the time scale of planetary science, uh, they will probably be extant for a few tens of millions or maybe one to two to 300 million years. And then these rings of Saturn will be gone 
Wow. So just as if you go on much longer cosmic time scales, if we yeah. look at the expansion of the universe mm -hmm. into billions of years from now, eventually we will lose sight of distant galaxies because the look back time will be gone. We will eventually not see the light from distant galaxies because wow. it won't make it to our local group. So in that sense, we're in a really good time to have Scotty and everyone else as our friends have telescopes and look at galaxies. And we're at a really good time now, at least for several tens of millions or longer uh, years to see Saturn's rings because they will not be there forever. Right. So you better get out there and see them while you can. <laughs> That's right. Okay. Then, uh, David, David, I've got a question uh, yes, about the moon. Um, the moon is one of my favorite subjects. And I've, like I explained before the show, I, I've been taking quite a bit of time this week to do imaging of the moon early in the morning this past week. But the question I have uh, is this, this planetary impact, this when Thea impacted the Earth, it had to be it had to be in a crossing orbit for a long time, right? And how, how did they interact? How did the moon and Thea interact? Is there thinking on that? Well, we don't know. And th that, that's a very good question. And you'd really love to know what were the dynamics of these billiard balls flying around early in the solar system. And that's one of the most difficult things that we have to try to trace or to reconstruct. And this is similar to trying to understand the origins of meteorites and what asteroids might be responsible for meteorites, some of which have been identified um, because of unique spectral signatures. We know that the HED meteorites come from Vesta and so on, but mm -hmm. tracing things back to where they were in this cosmic puzzle where everything is moving. And it wasn't necessarily uh, where it is now with regard to uh, distance from the sun either it's very, very difficult. And so we really don't know what the orbital dynamics of this collision were. It's thought that it may have been more or less a glancing collision, but it was direct enough to absorb most of that mass of this hypothetical Thea and, and produce a ring. And there are computer simulations that you can even see online that, that, that approximate it. But again, you know, it's a surmise. It's again, we really don't no, this is probably what happened to produce what we know we have now, but we yeah. don't have any direct evidence of how it happened. So it's a guess, really. Well, that's how we, I believe that's how we came to have such a large iron core in our planet, too, with the large mm -hmm. magnetic field. That's really a fortuitous thing for us. That's right. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Exactly right. Yep. Yeah. It, it's a well, fast object you know as much as it breaks the heart of a galaxy observer at times the moon it's it's a brilliant lovely object and it is our closest brightest neighbor to study in telescopes so we we need to appreciate it one of the things that amazes me i'm a kind of i'm an electro electrical guy and i when i learned about james clark maxwell and what he did with electromagnetism maxwell's equations in studying his life, I found out that one of the things he did was he developed a theory of the dynamics of those rings and won a prize in the middle 1800s for coming up with a dynamic theory of the existence and why they are stable and all of that. It's something worth looking at. I put a link in, in the, uh, the chat on that, but I had no idea he did that. And it was just one of those things while studying his life that really surprised me. He's one of my heroes. Mm, fantastic. And really interesting. We have a large number of, of giants we can stand on the shoulders of, as, as they say. Yeah. That's it's true. fascinating to study their lives and, and work. I'll, I, I'll look into that. I also want to, I want to point out something to our audience. Uh, we have uh, a couple of great authors here. Of course, David Levy's with us, and this is his latest book, A Night Watchman's Journey. Uh, uh, this book, uh, how, how would someone order this book, David? You're muted right now. The first step to ordering this book is to unmute yourself. <laughs> and the second step... <laughs> Right. Yeah, we've been keeping that book a pretty good secret, but it yeah. is available. If you're in the United States, I would recommend that you go to Star Arizona, www.starazona.com. 
and then just look for for uh, for me yeah, I'll... on the stars on a website. It'll bring the book up and you can get it from them. If you're anywhere else in the world or even in the United States, you can get it from the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada website, www.rasc.ca. That's www.rasc.ca. And you go to their online store, the book is available and you can get it from them. Right. And uh, it tells you the story and uh, both the bad parts and the good parts. I tried not to hide too much, including the fact that I was not the best of boys when I was a little kid, <laughs> even as a teenager. In fact, I even almost got expelled from the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada. Society of Canada. Oh my God. <laughs> as I'm sure you all know by now. But, uh, but over the years, I've uh, gotten a little bit better at what I'm doing. And, uh, right. And I'm now. It turned out uh, pretty good, David. I think it turned out okay. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. That's, that's the kind of stuff that makes a great biography, anyway. It's awesome. It is awesome insight into someone that uh, you know the trials and tribulations of of uh, someone that is uh, you know uh, watched so many thousands of hours, of, uh, you know, to observe the sky and to find all those comets. So. It's, it's great. This is another great book here. This is uh, from David Eicher, uh, Galaxies Inside the Universe's Star Cities. And uh, this one you can buy off of Amazon.com. I got my hardbound copy. I, I don't think it's available in paperback. So uh, no, a beautiful hard. book, um, you know, with, uh, you know, great images in here. I guess some of these images have never before been published. So really, really, really cool. Uh, when you go can to, I, can I interrupt for just a second, Scotty? Sure. Uh, that's not that's not the only one of David's books that I read. Very true. Another another one that he has written one on comets, and considering that Neowise has just come and waved at us and uh, gone away, um, I when that book came out, I teased David relentlessly about it, <laughs> but I want to say now that I've read it and I think it is a phenomenal book. It's one of the best books on comets. And that's from somebody who's written six books on comets. I really <laughs> applaud David's book on comets and well, I recommend you, it highly. And, and I can tell you that a, a certified absolute genius wrote the foreword to that book of mine. <laughs> his, his name is David Levy. Oh yeah, <laughs> that's good. <laughs> Well, moving right along now, Scotty. <laughs> well, when you get to David's book, of course, there's going to be lots of stuff about comets. There's also going to be uh, information, you know, his his writings, you know, from his from his observing logs are, are right in here. So it's just really cool. And um, so it's great to have uh, two wonderful authors of, uh, of astronomy uh, with us tonight. And... Um, so anyways, we're going to segue into uh, the young astronomers that we have with us tonight. We have Libby in the stars. Libby is 10 years old. Uh, she lives here in Northwest Arkansas, right, right in my own neighborhood out here, which is really cool. Behind her is, um, uh, I think, maybe her first telescope. Is that right? Yeah. And so that's a, that is a Mead telescope, a 60 millimeter refractor. Uh, on an alt azimuth mount. Uh, it might have been one of the telescopes that I made when I was working in Taiwan. I worked there for Mead Instruments for six years, uh, make, and we made hundreds of thousands of telescopes. And, um, you know, uh, sometimes astronomers that are into, uh, you know, who are, are serious into uh, our, lifestyle, our lifestyle think of such small telescopes as being uh, worthless, that, uh, you know, you can't really see anything with them, you can't do anything with them. Let me tell you, a small telescope, <laughs> a small telescope can take you a long, long way and give you many adventures. It, it's, it's not necessarily how big your telescope is or whatever when you start, but that you do just get started. And so, um, and sometimes that starts with a small gift telescope like that. Um, how, Libby, how did you get your first telescope? Um, I've, not, I've never really thought about being an astronomy 
And my mom's a kind of person. If she sees something today, she'll probably get it for me. She's like, she'll love it. She'll love it. So she she's on Facebook a lot. And anyway, there was this uh, person selling a fifteen dollar telescope on the Facebook market, and it's a pretty big one. And it was about in the middle of the summer we went to go pick it up on a rainy day and i remember going up to the doorstep picking it up from that person wow was, and only 15 was, bucks that was a great deal that was yeah. a wonderful deal that telescope certainly sold for more than 15 dollars uh, when it was new wow but it looks brand new it looks like it's in nice condition so uh wow. that's great that's great I, I begged my parents every night i was like can we take it out no, it's a school night. <laughs> you can't take it out to school night. Well, we know that you're an astronomer already, Libby. So, uh, and um, uh, you've been going through all the planets, and you're now on the dwarf planet. What it's now called the dwarf planet Pluto. So, why don't you uh, why don't you go ahead and get started and, and tell us more about it and something I want to put, I want to plant a seed right now. I want, I want you to start thinking about writing your first book about astronomy. I think that you could do a great job. I, I, I've always loved writing. That, it, it, astronomy wasn't my passion. I, I like to write too. And I, I know a couple of guys here on this, on this star party that uh, could probably give you a lot of good tips on writing a book. So you, know, you should second grade, I used to impress my class by writing a full page, a full page um, in my notebook and be like, I wrote this in 30 minutes. Awesome. Awesome. They'd be really happy. They were like, oh my gosh, you're crazy. Um, That's what it takes. <laughs> That's what it takes. A little craziness. That's right. I, I was really happy for this one because recently because of coronavirus i quit art lessons and i got a new digital art name and i thought i might as well get into it and do some um space scene art because this person came on here before and she was doing these fantasy ones and all that stuff and i love doing fantasy ones too as much as i love looking for the telescope looking at real objects it's also fun to fantasize because I grew up believing on aliens and ghosts. That was my whole thing. But <laughs> um, I definitely grew up on a bunch of fantasy stuff. And I thought I might as well start. And I wasn't really feeling doing a fantasy one for Pluto. So um, this art app, it's super professional and everything. And I'm not that professional with art. And I have all these fancy brushes that I didn't know how to use. So I kind of went a little bit crazy and I did a little art on um, on Pluto. So I'm going to try and... Um, you want to try to share your screen? Yeah. Here's that button. And I'm not sure. But I have it here downloaded on the computer. There we go. And here it is. Oh. Um, it's not a full circle because... um. If you were to, um, the picture that I was kind of basing it off um, that I found on the internet, I was looking at pictures to get some inspiration. You know, that side is only covered by the moon. And so I had lots of fun creating this. You could see brush strokes where I had some fun with the, <laughs> where I had some fun that with the brushes. And I definitely had, you could see there's some texture and everything. But I had a lot of fun doing it. And I I thought maybe now that I'm doing more and more galaxies and they're getting prettier, more nebulas and everything, I might as well do some more art because <laughs> on wow. on it's kind of hard to get a blank canvas in real life and then I can't see my pencil. And I've done art for a long time now. Um and I was it's just hard for me to do that. So I was switching over to digital. So I will be doing more of those. Mm -hmm. um, but anyway, back to the real planet, <laughs> not my art. But um, so Pluto is a very confusing planet because people can't decide whether it's a dwarf planet or an official planet. 
because it has to be this big amount to be official planet. And it's almost there. It's like if you on a roller coaster ride and, and they're like, you're one inch short, you're a dwarf planet. <laughs> um, so um, the other day, my science teacher is talking about planets as a, a example for writing a claim sentence. And she said that Pluto was named a dwarf planet in <laughs> um, 2003. And I was over there face palming myself. And I'm like, <clears throat> oh my gosh. I'm like, it was in 2006. And, you know, over like the past, ever since we discovered it, it's been back and forth. Like every 20 years or so, we'll be like, huh, maybe it's an official planet. I think we've made our mind now, hopefully. I mean, <laughs> it, it's it's definitely one of those planets that we're always active looking at because we're always like, it's a planet. No, it's a dwarf planet. Um, And I was, um, and David, he was in chat the other couple minutes ago, and he was telling me he knew the person who discovered it, Clyde Tomba. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna the the last name Tomba, I think it was. Right. Yeah. Right. Um, and that was in 1930. So about ever since then, it's been crazy with Pluto. Like, oh my gosh, it's a planet. No, it's a dwarf planet. <laughs> um, I personally think it's a dwarf planet because I mean, if it's not big enough, then it's not big enough. And <laughs> um, I think that's a huge part of it. Um. And I was I also like hearing about moons because imagine having times five the moons in our sky. You know that'd be bright. <laughs> um, it'd be definitely huge and bright. It it'd be awesome. You know all those fantasies where you have like ten of the moons in the sky. Well, Pluto has five of them, and their names are Charon, Nix, Hydra, Styx, and Kerberos. And I probably know I'm not pronouncing a bunch of them right, but I know definitely that there are five moons, and that'd be pretty cool. To have, like, five moons in the sky, you know, that'd be awesome. You could just look up five moons to the Earth. Imagine living on Pluto and being like, well, <laughs> there's so much to deserve, which I kind of think it would be awesome if NASA sent a probe to just orbit around the moons and take a little time. Because, I mean, Pluto didn't get discovered until a long time. You know, a lot of the planets, they're like, Saturn got discovered like 2,000 years before, not 2,000, 200 years before Pluto ever got discovered. And that's because it's far out in the solar system. And I think it's important that we still study that because, I mean, it will take lots of high power technology to be able to get really close to Pluto if you're using a telescope. And I've never seen Pluto through a telescope myself. I'm working up that way, but um, definitely it will be hard to <laughs> discover it. And I mean, you gotta have a huge telescope and at least some good eyepieces to get good pictures. Cause if I take a picture of Mars, it would be pretty good because that's there, it's close to us. But if I took a picture of Pluto, that's a lot of miles away from us. It's it's way too far to um, be way too far away from us. Um, and if you were thinking, so NASA right now, their whole goal is to get to Mars, which is if you look at a scale on the solar system. It's pretty close to us, but it's not. It's close. It looks like it's really close. It's three years. Now imagine how long that would be to get to Pluto, which is oh, yeah. far out. I mean, they're like, how do we have all this supply? And we were learning a lot about that at at space camp. And they're teaching us about like what NASA is going to do. And at the same time, I wasn't fully on thinking that we should just go to Mars. I was like, we should go to different planets, you know, take people to different planets. But if you realize how far away those planets are, it's a little bit difficult. You need to have a bunch of supply and rocket fuel and enough. And 
like working on that for, I mean, if it takes three years to get to Mars, then imagine how hard those people will have to work <laughs> just sitting in the office overnight for almost 10 years or so. And I also wanted to talk about this because I'm extremely interested in this. Um, I know a lot of movies, they talk about the force, which is basically like magnetics pulling. And I was, I always thought this as a fantasy, but if you think about a planet and it's pulling or a solar system, the sun is pulling the planets around it and it's kind of weakening over how far out the solar system gets. You think that, you know, if you think that like Neptune, last time I was, you know, saying that would be extremely long, like a couple, over 100 years to take a trip around the solar system. This is 248, you know. <laughs> I like making this joke and I always say, try having a birthday. <laughs> <laughs> it's not gonna happen on Pluto. Yeah. It's not gonna happen on Pluto. Better be good. It'll be a really good birthday. Mm -hmm. You'll turn right. one years old and then it's over. <laughs> you know, you stay young. Um, but uh I was I'm really interested in learning about the magnetic field and solar winds and stuff. Cause that stuff, all that is invisible. Like it's invisible but somehow it's pulling a full, like a bunch of weight around us. And at space camp, they would sit down and they would tell us about, they just tell us they had a huge feeder and they just have a presentation. And I remember them telling me about magnetic force. Now, when they told me about that, it wasn't very a, um, a very good one. And when I went to go to space camp, I had a lot of knowledge and I thought they were going to be talking about light years like in depth and stuff. Now they did give me good teaching, but when I have, I definitely have a lot more research from doing it on my own about magnetic fields than what they gave me at space camp. But the general idea ever since going to space camp, I've been re researching that because I wanted to learn more about the magnetic field. And I thought that that was pretty cool because Mercury's spinning crazy around the sun. <laughs> I mean, and then Pluto's 248 years. That, that's a long time. Um, but that is, I really wanted to learn more about that. Um, but uh, Libby, what, what, what was the most fascinating thing that you, you've learned so far about Pluto? Um, I'm kind of amazed on how late we discovered it. I mean, back then it was like the Roman gods discovered this planet. <laughs> no. Right. The, the story of the discovery is very interesting. It is true. Yeah. It right? was crazy how like, they're like the Roman gods discovered Saturn. Well, it took them a couple 200 years until they could figure out <laughs> that there was another planet named Pluto in our solar system. It was pretty crazy. <laughs> I mean, I was even amazed by that, you know, um, back then a long time ago when they were, um, the Roman gods and everything, when they're naming the planets and they were found the planets in the sky just by looking, and then you realize how long it took <laughs> For them to find another planet so far out, I mean, it's reasonable because it's so far out in the solar system, but it's also a little bit crazy compared. Okay. Okay. Well, Libby, thank you very much. Um, and uh, uh, we will, um, we will uh, now uh, go to uh, DT Gautam in Nepal. And um, DT, how are you doing today? Did we lose her? I don't see her. I don't see her either. No, well, she, she may come back. Um, she may have lost internet. That's possible. I, I, that's too bad. 
uh, DT is, uh, has been giving uh, uh, some very nice uh, talks about uh, astronomy in Nepal, and um, uh, her talk tonight was supposed to be about satellites and the importance of satellites, uh, certainly in their country, but to people around the world. But um, we will move on. Uh, if she comes back, we'll, uh, we'll insert her at, at, after our break. But uh, let's, uh, let's turn to uh, John Goss at the Astronomical League. Uh, John, um, thank you for joining us. Uh, and um, um, uh, the Astronomical League is the official sponsor of the door prizes for the uh, Explore Alliance and our glo global star parties. Uh, and um, each, uh, each star party, that, you know, a different representative of the league comes on and they do it kind of in rotation, which is pretty cool. Uh, you know, the, uh, the people that are involved with the league, if I took all the knowledge of all these, these people, um, it's pretty substantial. And the uh, experience that all these people have, uh, you know, from uh, uh, Chuck Allen, yourself, uh, uh, John, um, Carol Orge and Terry Mann, uh, you know, all of you have been uh, former presidents of uh, the Astronomical League, uh, which is just an amazing organization uh, and growing every year um, and now going international, which is totally cool. Um, but um, uh, I want to point out at, at each one of the uh, global star parties that you too can join the Astronomical League. You just go to astroleague.org. Uh, no matter where you are in the world, if if you uh, if you are so inclined to uh, join from another country, um, you can join a, as an at-large member. Um, if you're in the United States, you can join with your astronomy club uh, if they are a league club. Um, uh, I understand from Terry Mann that. Uh, uh, that uh, the league is looking forward to having other astronomy clubs from around the world join in. So that's that's very cool as well. So, but let's go ahead and get started, John. Um, and uh, I think that you might be muted as well. No. No. Okay. I, I'm, I'm I saw just, your I'm lips moving. No words. <laughs> I just couldn't hear guy. any words. So. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, let let me uh, see if I can get on here. Alrighty, um, I'd like to start by bringing something up. You know, we're amateur astronomers. We like uh, sharing the ex our experience in the skies with others. We like telling other people about what's coming up. Well, you probably all know about this really great conjunction coming up next month with Jupiter and Saturn. Um, I don't wanna go into to that, but I just wanna emphasize that this is an uh, ideal opportunity uh, for all of us to interact with the public, because this is something that they, they can see. They can see Jupiter slowly approaching Saturn in the night sky, in the, in the early evening sky, over the next uh, uh, five, six weeks, something like that. <clears throat> so along those lines, uh, on our Astronomical League Facebook page, we have a, a, a handout that you can uh, download, print, and cut out. And basically it describes what's gonna be going on over the next six, seven weeks and encourages people, anybody, uh, to go out and look and see if they can see this happening. Uh, so the idea is for people to, to, to cut these out and hand, hand them out to people who they think would be like to be, would like to become more astronomically aware of what's going on in the night sky. So you could uh, give them to your friends, neighbors, colleagues, whatever, people who you think might be interested. Um, it's just a handout showing where Jupiter and Saturn are in the sky and how to measure the distance. You know, that the famous index finger angular size uh, es estimation uh, shows how to do that. Tells a little bit about what's going on. So hopefully people get, get interested in this and as I said, become more astronomically aware that maybe they'll, they'll actually want to become more interested in stargazing and amateur astronomy and uh, just be part of our big club here. I think that, that would be really cool. Um, so as I said, this is on the Astronomical League Facebook page. Mm -hmm. So I'd like, like to start then, we have a few questions to ask. Um, but first I'd like to emphasize that, um, you know, we like looking at, at things in the sky. 
well, if the sun is, is a special thing, a special hazard, we want to make sure that people know what they're doing if they actually look at the sun. So we like to have this, this slide here just reminding everybody, reminding us uh, that we have to be careful in doing so. We have to have the right filters. We have to uh, know exactly what, what we're doing when we look at the sun. When we do all the correct steps, it's not hard and it's not, not dangerous at all, but you got to be prepared for this. Now, for my first question, actually, I should have turned this, <laughs> you'll see the first question in a moment. I should have turned it over to Dave Iker because he, he kind of took, took it over on me. Show you right here, talking about moons, moons formation, um, which he might, he might be able to uh, uh, insert some, some, some better figures here. I'm sorry, John, but, uh, I, I did not know. My apologies. Yeah. Oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> hey, nobody owns the moon, buddy. <laughs> but, it, but anyway, you know, we talked about how, how long ago that was. Well, the current theory, you got this Thea, the Mars-sized body striking the Earth about 4.6 billion years ago. Okay. Uh, and then you had this big debris field and fragments form in it. Something like 100 years or so it takes for these things to coalesce into stuff which uh, then stick together accrete into the moon. So when the moon was first formed, how far away was the thought to orbit our world? Uh, I have to be careful here to speak because I tend to give away the answer every time when I talk, but we have three choices. Um, was, was it, and still is it, and, excuse me, was it about 240,000 miles, which is about, about what it is today? Um, was it zero miles simply because it spun off our planet and there it was, uh, or was it someplace between 12,000 12, and 20,000 miles from Earth? So you have your A, B, or C. And I think I got the answer there, don't I? Doggone it. Okay. <laughs> Let me look that. Okay. A, B, or C. <laughs> okay, the next question here. Let's see if I got the answer to this. Ah, get off this side here. Okay, um, I got something wrong here. I don't think I did it right. Well, I'm, I'm, mess, I'm messing this up. So I'm gonna have to uh, skip this part. And I'm gonna, sh I'm, gonna sh I'm just gonna have to sh show, show you what it was. Um, question number two is if you look carefully at the- uh, these, are, these are the answers for- yeah last star party correct yeah yeah uh, sorry, right. i messed that up i'm sorry um, that's okay no it's not okay because we don't want to mess things up here we never <laughs> to but the question is okay. still valid okay uh if you look at today's star maps at the constellation taurus you will see that uh the flamsteed numbers represented are you know 30 31 32 33 stars uh, and going to 35 and 36 for a number of your flam uh, Flamsteed star. Why isn't num number 34 found? Now, this is a, a, one of historical interest. Uh, you could believe that the star that Flamsteed uh, indicated was 34 went supernova, so it was no longer here. That, that's one possibility. Um, it was simply an error of omission. Okay, that, that could happen. Or did Flamsteed number the star uh, but it, did it, he has unknowingly assigned it to uh, Uranus, thinking it was a star. And of course, Uranus has long since departed that constellation. Uh, so th those are the three choices for that. The next one that I messed up. <laughs> ah, don't look at that. <laughs> Question number three. You now, the astronomically puts out a, a, a quarterly magazine. Uh, and all of its members are, are eligible to receive it. Uh, it's something that is um, um, produced by volunteers. Members produce it, members publish it, do everything with it. Uh, so what's the name of this magazine? It's been going on for roughly 60 years. Is it the Astroliger magazine? Is it the Reflector magazine? Or is it the Observer magazine? Um, I'd like to refer to Dave Iker on one, one more thing here, Dave. I, I, on the name Earth, the Earth versus Earth. You know, here I'm talking about, is it the Astroleaguer or is it Astroleaguer magazine? Well, I, I heard a talk given by you, I'd say about 15 years ago about Earth or the Earth, and you set me straight. And since then, I've always been calling it Earth. 
I write a monthly astronomy column for a newspaper and I always say earth, never Bless the you, earth. John. Bless you. So, you know, there are yeah. planetary scientists who say the earth, you know, <laughs> PhD, yeah, well, you know, yeah. But, yeah, but to me, it always seems so silly, but I mean, everyone says that, but but it's the equivalent of saying the Jupiter or the Mars. You yeah. Know? yeah. We, we, we have the same out. problem in French, you know, uh, we call it la terre. It should, it should be tired. Just uh, so it's the same. We have the same problem. <laughs> well, you know, people go the moon. Well, that's not Earth, though. That that's that's the, the moon. So, but thank you for that. I I was listening and I I, I learned something from that. Um, okay. Um, I think that's all I have then, Scott. Okay. Okay. Well, thanks very much, John. Thanks for for sharing that and. Um, I've, we are going to take. I've been, I, I've been, been doing. Uh, <laughs> so I've been talking to my son recently. I've been I've been talking about search tools and stuff on the internet, and I I started calling Google the Google. So I say <laughs> I'm going to go to the Google to do stuff. <laughs> <laughs> so it's funny how you can get the word the in front of stuff to make it. That's the one, right? So. So Depty's back. Is she back already? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah, I'm back. <laughs> Hi, Depty. How are you? Hi. You made it. Okay. All right. Yeah. Yes. So um, why don't we do this? Uh, why don't we take a 10-minute break? And after the, our break, uh, we will um, we'll have DP give her presentation. Okay? Does that sound all right for, with everyone? Okay. Okay. All right. So here we go. Good to have you back, DT. <laughs> yeah, sometimes we get internet problems. That's okay. Yeah. So yeah, today I'm going to give my presentation about a satellite. Maybe the satellite signal is giving ghost bomb. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Now, are you connected by satellite on the internet? Is that how you how you connect or? No, no, no. No, no. Okay. <laughs> All right. Yeah, but it but automatically internet is linked with the satellite. <laughs> Ultimately, I'm sure it is. Yeah. Okay. All right. I will be right back too. So.
That's incredible. Wow. The seeing so good. It is very good. It is very good. Look at all the detail on the belts, the great yeah. red spot. Incredible. What can you tell us about uh, Jupiter, Chris? Uh, you can see the great red spot here. This is uh, probably the largest storm in the solar system. It's been clocked about three, uh, 600 kilometers per hour, winds of 600 kilometers per hour. And uh, one thing we know about uh, the great red spot now, it's shrinking. So it's getting smaller and smaller. In fact, uh, last year, it, I think, dropped a quarter of a percent of its size. Basically, wow. uh, almost a quarter of its size. So it's, 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 uh, I hope it doesn't disappear on my lifetime because it's going to make Jupiter quite boring. <laughs> and one thing incredible that happened to Jupiter quite recently is the North, North Equatorial Belt. I think we, in, in one of the uh, Global Star Party we had, we, we, there was a discovery of the, one of the outbreaks of this uh, North Equatorial Belt. So this year, uh, there are three uh, very powerful outbreaks erupted on this. These are very giant thunderstorms, about probably half the size of the Earth, running at about 700 miles per hour. So these are incredible, violent uh, storms that basically erupted on the north, uh, north, north tropical zone of Jupiter. No, uh, no, north temperate zone of Jupiter, the NTB. And uh, this year, there were three outbreaks that appeared. Uh, around around uh, the area above the North Equatorial Belt. But, you know, looking at this image, this is really incredible. You see so many details in this image. In fact, um, you know, the seeing goes in and out. And, uh, Shireen, are you, make, are, are you capturing anything right now? This is a very good image. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I don't know. It's a bit of a dilemma at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> you can actually do you can actually do an ROI and uh, uh, you a, need to capture What you were watching was um, uh, some uh, uh, a few minutes of the uh, live capture of Jupiter from the 20th Global Star Party um, uh, that uh, that was uh, Happening at um, uh, in in South, Southeast Asia, you know, uh, you were hearing the voice of Christopher Go in the Philippines. I think that that particular image was coming from Malaysia uh, at that time, but it was just uh, incredible seeing conditions and uh, you know just some of the amazing stuff that our our astrophotographers capture during some of the global star parties. But I, I would say that that particular. Uh, night uh, over there, uh, we were having some of the best seeing conditions and seeing some of the greatest detail of planets that, that we could possibly get. So that was, that was really awesome. Um, Deep T. Uh, Gautam was uh, supposed to go on before our break here. We're going to let her uh, do her presentation. Uh, she has um, uh, been focusing on satellites and, uh, you know, it's an important part of uh, our, our space uh, explorations that we'll have to have, not only communications here on Earth, but uh, we have to communicate uh, with, um, uh, you know, our uh, exploration, uh, the people who'll be exploring the moon when we get there in 2024 and then on to Mars later. So, um, but Deepti, uh, why don't you go ahead and, and start your presentation now and uh, I will give you the, the stage. And I think you're muted. There you yeah. go. Hello, everyone. Yeah, I have present, um, made some presentation here. Right. Let me prepare. OK, today I have some talk about the satellite. And as we know, the satellite is the most important part of our life. And I, yeah, we are all together here talking each other is uh, somehow due to the uh, this help the satellite and if there will be no satellite then uh, we'll be like in the past like uh, writing the letters and talking to each other and that is that is the very hard things as we know uh, yeah first of all i would like to go from the definition of 
um, because I have prepared some of the basic introduction in uh, importance uh, for today's series. And like us, uh, here is a satellite is a moon, planet, or machine that uh, orbit a planet or stars. For example, our Earth is a satellite because it's orbit the sun. Likewise, the moon is a satellite because it's orbit the Earth. Usually, the Earth satellite refers to a machine that is launched into the space and move around the Earth or another body in this space. So, our Earth itself is a satellite. And how we have uh, the uh, two types of satellite that is uh, natural satellite and artificial satellite. And um, we know the natural satellite like Moon, Titan, Ganymede, and a lot of satellites and artificial satellites, Sputnik first, and uh, Arabot, and etc. And like they are working. And here is some of the fact about uh, which uh, reflect the importance of the natural satellite. Do you know our Earth will not be safe place to live on without our natural satellite Moon? Yeah. Of course, we, our life will not be a safe place to live on without our natural satellite moon. Uh, because without its gravity, Earth will open more violently on its axis, that drastically altering the climate and the hurricanes and the, all those um, natural disaster and, and Earth signature. And do you know that Earth signature 23.5 degree tilt on its axis is due to the uh, due to the moon keeping it in inspection uh, because the moon keep it in inspection and so the earth is tilt and uh, all of, all the things are balanced in the earth and we can live alive and here is the one of the uh, art um, which was made by the um, yeah, this um, Secondary class, secondary school levels student, Harina Sodari. Uh, she, she was the first, uh, she was the winner of the National Space Art Competition, which was organized by Nepal Astronomical Society, NASA. And she beautifully presented how the life uh, without the satellite and without, uh, with satellite. Um, this, um, people are confused about the, about the map and here yeah, they can use their mobile phone to detect the places and um, here, uh, if uh, the people can't afford uh, to go out and play, so they can enjoy and watch the you know, watch the match in these televisions uh, due to the help of the satellites. And mm -hmm. uh, you, at first, um, without the satellite, you have to write the letters and send to the uh, very uh, send to your friends, and it, it takes a lot of time uh, to receive the letters and again send the letters. But um, due to the help of the satellite, due to the help of the internet. Um, and Facebook and messengers and that Instagram email etc. And we are, we get immediately the messages. So we can imagine our how the satellite are helping us. Satellite is helping us. And this, uh, we said uh, we are in the modern era. And the uh, to be in the modern era, is the satellite has played a lot of a lot of huge big role. And yeah, here I have represented the different types of artificial satellites and some of the, some of the artificial astronomical satellite that uh, um, get this um, different information about the other planets and uh, out of the heavenly bodies and etc. And uh, we have the communication satellite and um, which make us available to communicate with each other uh, through using the Facebook Messenger and all the mobile phone signals and call, etc. And uh, we have the Earth observation satellites and Earth observation satellites uh, detect the different uh, phenomena in the Earth and the, this all the act of uh, in the, inside this Earth. And we have the killer satellite, and uh, we know that uh, all the country has their own satellite for the specifically for the uh, security purpose. And for this uh, war warriors and um, this um, uh, the killer satellites are made uh, to be safe from the enemies and we have the navigation satellite um, we can detect the places and um, yeah we use the GPS system we are very familiar to the GPS and um, due to this uh, this satellites so we are using the GPS and uh, we have the weather satellites that we can detect the uh, what's the temperature and etc and uh, just i'm using the weather satellite help of the weather satellite and i got to know we have the that's um 16 degrees celsius in nepal <laughs> and um here's the space station and, um uh, this uh, different satellites and space station is uh itself a satellite um that's the international space station uh is itself a satellite and where it carries the peoples and uh, astronomer astronomers and um the astronaut uh, for many researchers and 
everything. And space-based solar power, the, the specifically the work of the space-based solar power is to collect the energy from the sun and others, uh, heavenly body, others outside the space and uh, transmit to the different place of the earth uh, for the, any for the specific use. And, um, Furthermore, there are a lot of satellites um, used for different purposes, and um, more than, uh, according to data, the more than 8,900 satellites have been launched up to now. 8,900? Satellite, more than 8,900 satellites from more than 40 countries. Wow. So and one of them, yeah, one of them uh, very, from very, Nepal, too. <laughs> very important to humanity, that's for sure. That's for sure. Yeah. DT, what do you think is the most important satellite uh, or the types of satellites that are most important to the future of, uh, of, of civilization? Um, the most important is, um, the, uh, of course, the communication satellite. If we have, uh, we didn't have the communication satellite, we can hear anything. Though you have the uh, idea of the astronomy, though you have the idea of yes, uh, do you get the import this uh, any rigs, and you can't hear with anyone, then it's all the vain. You no know, nothing is important. So I think the communication satellite is most important in my view. Yes, I would agree. I would definitely. Yeah. Agree. And uh, some of the importance of artificial satellites, and uh, we have the uh, of artificial satellites. Um, yeah, we are familiar with the communication and uh, military purposes, security and uh, recognitions and GPS and weather forecasting and disaster management itself and security is in research and study. And uh, we did the research, different types of research and um, and because of the health of the satellite, because we got the data of the um, of the outside the or also the inside of the uh, space uh, by the help of the uh, satellite use of the satellites, and um, and uh, maybe this uh, how the agriculture in it uh, satellite how the satellite help in the agriculture so. Um, agriculture uh, in the artificial artificial satellites help uh, in the agriculture by observing these, um, all the types of the farmers and uh, observing the field and uh, telling the farmer, letting the farmer which field need to be fertilized uh, to produce the more healthy crops and uh, observing the, uh, all this phenomena which is happening in, um, okay, and uh, communication, yeah, of course, uh, the, we can see this, uh, visualize and we can just see the examples. Uh, we are communicating with each other, it's very easy, very fluently. Um, due to the help of the artificial satellite and a GPS system and um, GPS and global position system and uh, we have the weather forecasting uh, yeah we all got it. we have just dis uh, discussed about the weathers of different country here just in the starting and due to the help of the weather forecasting and um, disaster management and uh, yeah uh, by the use of the satellite you can know the uh, about the man about the disaster happen or going to be happen or over this um over the disaster and uh, for the security's purpose to and as we know uh us also had the a lot of satellites for this um many satellites for the security purpose for the future and um Many country has this um, security security purpose that uh, launched the satellite for the security purpose and research and study. And so, yeah, of course, I got the knowledge about the about the astronomy and about the space by the help of the satellite. And at last, uh, I want to say this: uh, satellite improve life, and it's the uh, yeah, as we know, it's the slogan of the theme of this recently space week also, and. Yeah, I have done, uh, I have started my research uh, about the satellite um, from this space week because I got this topic very interesting and uh, I love to uh, know about, I love to source about the satellite and this, I was shocked, oh my God, <laughs> the satellite is just the part of our, uh, part of her life is, uh, I think without the satellite, our life is or not the, not possible. So we can, we can't imagine life without possible in this era. Uh, just we are in the just we said we are in the modern era and that's uh, due to the satellite yeah and this must yeah thank you yeah thank you so much deep tea thank you <laughs> thank you excellent thank you okay so <laughs>
Next. I have a question for you, Dipti. Uh, yeah, yes. What are your thoughts about uh, satellites impeding uh, observing from the Earth with with telescopes? Uh, the uh, the problem that the uh, imager have about uh, taking great image of uh, of the night sky because of satellites. Well, is there a, a common ground, a, a, some kind of a a way that we can get past that problem? About the photography? Yeah, because when we are, we are photographing the night sky from Earth, you have all those satellites passing by, and that yeah. makes it kind of a, a line and streaks and pictures, and uh, and it won't get uh, any better because they're going to send more and more satellite up there. What are your thoughts about that? Yeah, there's a lot of uh, the satellite uh, that's um, pollution in this space too. Uh, uh, due to this, uh, uh, a lot of satellite, as I said, uh, there's a lot of satellite have been launched. Uh, more than 8,900 satellites and um, many, uh, many of the satellites are going to be launched. And yeah, uh, this is pollution. So for that, uh, maybe uh, we can uh, get this uh, we can know the timing of the satellite, yeah, moving over the timing of the satellite. So we can um, detect that and yeah, of course, I think uh, for now we can, uh, <laughs> uh, we can have the timing, <laughs> uh, we can have the timing about uh, knowing the okay. time uh, after getting the timing of the satellites and yeah. uh, uh, getting ready for the astrophotography and I think uh, Okay. Now, for now, I don't have any idea for that. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Very good. Okay, so let's let's take a moment to uh, switch over to Richard Grace, the Astro Beard. Uh, he's been uh, he's been doing some imaging, uh, and um, so I'm really curious as to what he's he's uh, captured so far. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Here uh, we've got the Pleiades. I've been uh, messing around with some uh, this software, which is uh, SharpCap Pro. Um, oh wow! It, it's the paid version of SharpCap, mm -hmm. and um, it allows you to do um, a, a few more things: uh, stretch the histogram, and uh, also to do live stacking. So we've got fifteen frames stacked a half an hour um right now two minute images and uh for the last half an hour it seems like everything's calmed down a little bit because earlier it was windy it was messing up everything and uh the plastic finder scope bracket on a 150 and fifty skywatcher i mean not skywatcher explore scientific 130 newtonian um has a little flex to it because you know it's not really meant for an astrograph but uh <laughs> it's doing all right <laughs> Not bad. You're getting images. That's for sure. So I, um, I, I'm doing this scope for multiple reasons. Cause I like playing with, uh, you know, things that are, um, made of obtainium, but also, um, tomorrow marks, uh, one year from the mercury transit, which was pretty much my first, uh, real thing that I tried to photograph. So I'm kind of uh, revisiting uh, one of my earlier scopes, which was uh, another 130 that had a much more unacceptable focuser, which will go unnamed. Um, but uh, yeah, just messing around with this and uh, it's not perfect in focus uh, tonight, you know, rushing for the star party to get together and I might go out there and redo some stuff in between. Um, it's now not bad next... though. You can definitely see the nebulosity around the stars. Um, yeah, uh, I noticed that it's got it looks like a six point diffraction spike. Uh, that's due to the uh, the three veins that hold the secondary mirror, okay, um, in, the, in the Newtonian. Uh, so even though there's three veins, it's gonna cross, cause the opposite side to do it and cause uh, six pointed right. stars. And uh, I see they're kind of like snowflakes, it's uh, pretty it's cool. You know, diffraction spikes aren't for everybody, and they're definitely not for every object. But mm -hmm. for some things, it, it really makes them look cool. Yes. And uh, I also, um, on what uh, was just being talked about, was uh, the impact of satellites. I, uh, I had my first experience <clears throat> with uh, the, uh, the Starlink. As a matter of fact, it had, uh, I had never had an issue 
with, with, with any of them. And I got photo bombed. What last week, th- this is the image from last week that, uh, we were, uh, doing Orion when we waited till the end of the, uh, I got bombed by so many starlings came right through here. And I mean, I know it had to be starling cause it was a whole train of them and I stacked it up and they disappeared. So honestly, I just want to say that for when you have some really bright streak down your image might not have been a starling. I don't know, but, um, I know that some of the bigger satellites out there have, have definitely, it didn't stack out, but I had a whole train of them run through that image and it looks pretty good to me. Yeah. It looks excellent. So it looks excellent. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. So, um, our next, uh, our next speaker will be, uh, Norman Fulop. Uh, Norman, uh, has, uh, been on our show several times. He, um, he is uh, musical. He is, uh, he's, in my mind, one of the genius uh, telescope makers of our era. Uh, he is, uh, he's making uh, telescopes from uh, small ones that you would see, uh, you know, in, in your backyard, except these are ones that actually you wouldn't see in your backyard because they are, they're beautiful works of art the, that, um, that he carves from wood and, uh, um, you know, just just the amazing, inspired uh, 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 works that uh, in, should probably be in, in not just in a museum, but uh, certainly on display in a very special part of your house, which well, actually, many of them you, are. <laughs> now that you mention it, Scott, uh, there'll be one of my telescope in the Toronto Astronomy Museum. <laughs> oh wow! Very cool. Very cool. Yeah. Well yeah, they acquired the telescope uh, last last winter, and they uh, they're gonna open a new uh, Canadian space uh, museum uh, and exhibiting all kind of uh, astronomy stuff from Can Canadians. So yeah, I'll be. I'm very proud of that. <laughs> yeah, you should be. You should. Be. Yeah. Yeah, and and uh, of course he makes he's made all of his own. Uh, uh, telescope fabricating equipment um, makes his own designs. Uh, it's just uh, amazing to me what what this guy has done in such really a relatively short amount of time. Yeah, so it's it's a it, it's a it's a pleasure to have you back on, Norman. Well, thank you, Scott. Um, first of all, I would like to thank you, Scott, to uh, to, uh, to create these uh, event, the Global Star Party. This is great to have you to have, see all those people interested in, 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 in star parties, even if we not, cannot attend the, the star party personally. Uh, at least we have the feeling of uh, a presence of people that think like we are uh, about astronomy and observing. So it's very um, appreciated, and especially the, to invite me to be part of it is, is very, very uh, yeah, it's special. It's special for feeling. Us. It is, of course, all of you that, that make this uh, star party yeah. as special as it is. Yeah, and the audience as well. So I'm, I'm just the guy that's uh, adjusting. <laughs> well, here, so. <laughs> you, you, you made it. You made it. It's made you, you made it yours. That's good. Thank you. Oh, cool. uh, Thank you. So, um, Scott, you uh, I asked you earlier today what you wanted me to talk want me to talk about today, because uh, we've been through a few a few subjects so far. And you said, well, why don't you talk about some observing experience that we have that I had? Yeah. So, um, if I have to talk about memorable observing uh, session, we'd have for a few days to talk about. <laughs> right. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> some that come come up come to mind uh, right away. Um, my early years in astronomy or telescope making or really getting to observing would be uh, first that comes to mind is telephane. Uh, it's it's probably the first large uh, star party that I attended, um, and gathering of telescope maker also. But most of most of my experience as cellophane that really impressed me was uh, friendship and uh, contact that, with human contact about astronomy uh, and observing the sky and the beauty of the universe. It's uh, cellophane is a magical place. Uh, and you walk around the site 
and then you meet people. You don't see them because it's dark. <laughs> you, don't know who you, you don't know who you're talking to <laughs> most of the time. But the uh, the feeling is the same. The, the experience is pretty much the same. Everyone is so happy to make you observe through their telescope and whatever uh, object or nebula or galaxy that, that you're going to look through. Uh, it's a part of that person's uh, happiness, I think. And uh, it's special to, to, to share experience and vision. And most of the time, people will show you object that you never saw. And it makes you think, well, that's something, an object I will like to observe with my telescope eventually, and then take notes and then try to remember uh, that object. And what, what really, really uh, gets to me at Stellafane is uh, the energy. I think the energy of uh, that we all create uh, about observing visually, because most of most of the uh, people over there do visual observing. I'm a visual observer myself since day one. Uh, I have nothing I got about imagers. Uh, you do, you guys make great, great, great work. I love to see those beautiful image. It's it's very inspiring. But for me personally, and lots of people, is the experience of the eyepiece, uh, the image that, the, that you receive in your eyeball. I mean, it's a direct contact with the universe. It's not, um, I mean, those photons travel billions and billions and billions of, of kilometers of light years of distance, thousands, millions of light years, and you get them concentrated into your eyes. And it's, it's, the, it's the physical. It's not just an image. It's, it's the particle itself that travels that distance that reflects in the mirror and then gets into your eye. So it's the, it's the direct connection. For me, it's, it's very, very um, intimate con connection with the universe when you observe visually. Uh, that's what makes, really makes me come back every time and make me uh, think about who we are where we are and what is our place in that in this all big universe so yeah observing by myself is great but in a group with friends and to share the, the experience is very important for me that's why i never stop to go to star party even if i my time is kind of short uh, with all the work that i do uh, i try to uh, to go to most of the the big event but tonight i'm going to talk well first my first impression was telephone that i wrote down uh another star party or event that uh, really comes to mind is uh, the winter star party in uh, florida uh one one particularly year i was there uh, i had brought um, a 16 inch wooden telescope that i just finished to build and i was very proud of it and and just, the, just the, the, um, the trip to go down from Canada down to Key West with my van and all my equipment and everything. And I get to custom and the guy looking at this wooden telescope in the back of my van said, what the hell is that? <laughs> it's just that. It's, it's an experience in itself. It's very fun. And then get there, get all my equipment uh, exposed. And then um, that night, uh, I had uh, three very good friends. Uh, sitting down with me on the beach. Uh, uh, Marcus Lourdes, probably know Marcus from APM uh, in Germany. Uh, I know Marcus for many, many years. Uh, Alan Treno was there. Yes. Passed away last year, unfortunately, uh, for, a heart, for a heart attack. But Alan was the first to invite me at NIF, uh, the Northeast Astronomy uh, Gathering every year in April. He's the one that invited me the first time many years ago. And then after that, he had bought a couple of my telescope. And one other very important person was Awi Gladder that also passed away a few years back. I don't know if you know Awi Gladder. He was the one that uh, he was making all kinds of um, laser for, uh, for telescope, aligning telescopes and all kinds of neat tricks. He's a machinist. He was doing all kinds of stuff. And, Lots of he likes to talk about politics, <laughs> but we won't get into that. But that night, I remember very vividly. Um, we were sitting down. We just 
talking about astronomy, what we were doing, and then the scope was there. And then at one point, I I pointed an object that I don't usually go to, and especially at uh, a winter star party. You want to watch uh, uh, Omega Centauri, you want to watch M42 because it's in the winter, you get a great view. But right next to it in the Canis Major, you get this uh, NGC 2359, which is uh, also nine, uh, the Taurus helmet. So it's not an object that you don't really observe very often. So I just pointed out there, and then we took turn. Uh, we went to the IP, said, hey, what's that? He, he wasn't very, um, uh, he didn't know very much about it. So I started, And then after that, Alan Trainer looked at it, and then Marcus went at the eyepiece. And he was very, very impressed because he could see by lots of details, and we all talked about what we could see and what it means, the look that it, it had. And at that point, Marcus said, Norm, it's that object just sold me that telescope. So he bought that telescope right there on the spot. Wow. <laughs> So that was pretty special. Yeah. Because <laughs> Mark is a very impulsive but, person. He's a very impulsive buyer, Marcus. I know that Marcus from the first time that I went to to Neve, uh, he had his uh, his uh, his booth right next to mine uh, on this on the floor. And before Neve opened, so I had I was setting up my telescope on tables and stuff, and I had that small six inch telescope, wooden telescope, one of my first uh that I was selling, um, and he, he looked at the scope. He, he did some kind of a, of a of a of a light test on with a, with the light in, into the auditorium, and uh, he said, "Norm, you're going to send that telescope to Germany right away." <laughs> so <laughs> he would thank that kind of guy. But just to say that that night with Awi, Alan, Marcus, and me looking at the Taurus helmet, something that. Looks casual, but for me it meant a lot because we were sitting now all friends. Okay, the contact between people and the universe. Another great event that I can remember. Uh, you were there, Scott, uh, at the uh, Starfest in Toronto, near Toronto, in Canada. Yes. Uh, you were there. I had the 36 inch, my, one of my first 36 inch telescope, there on site. And then we were, you were, you had brought your first, I think if I remember right, 17 millimeters, 100% uh, percent field of view, 100 yeah. degrees. And you wanted to, to compare different type of IPs and stuff. And then we observed most of the night with the 36. And I don't know if you were there when we observed that object, but M17 uh, with the 36 inch telescope. Yeah. It was just mesmerizing. I still see the image in my, I close my eye and I see the image of it. The entire structure of the nebula itself, it was just mesmerizing. Uh, and for my last uh, observing uh, memory that I have, um, I was, you were talking with Libby earlier about her small telescope, okay? Yes. Uh, I was in Namibia. Uh, on two years ago, uh, I was invited by uh, a mining company, Canadian mining company, that uh, has a program for the local. F in the, it's called the Little Shop of Physic. So the uh, they have some kind of a. Uh, well, how could I call that? It's a uh, for the for all the, the school and children around the the, the small village in Africa, in Namibia. To educational, okay, about physics and all kind of biology and all and kind of stuff. And the guy had met the I had met the president of the company in Toronto at a meeting, a big conference for mining, and um, he was saying that the next project will be on astronomy. They want to do a planetarium and a planet, a small observatory to to educate people in astronomy in uh, in Namibia. So. The year after, I was in Namibia myself, and visiting the the site, and then to to to, to do the uh, to start to think about that project to to um, to install a planetarium, a mobile planetarium, and an observatory with different type of telescope in it for education purple purpose over there. But what we what I want to talk about is the first night that I got to Namibia, so the first time that I was in Southern Hemisphere. And I don't know if any one of you guys went to Namibia, but it's one of the darkest sites in the world. Uh, I think 70% of the country is a desert, 
and the rest is uh, half desert, half uh, vegetation. But there's 90, I think it's 90% of the country is not electrified. So there's no electricity uh, available to a small village. So it's pitch black. So there's no light pollution whatsoever. So the first night I got there, my, my host took me to the back country and then he stopped the car, the, the, the vehicle, and then he closed the light and he said, wait five minutes so your eyes get used to the, the darkness. And we just walked out of the car. And the night, the, the, the view that I had of the Milky Way, it was just, I, I was blown away, completely blown away. Just no telescope, nothing, just the view, okay? It's like, it was like a picture. You had the two magnetic cloud there, the center of the galaxy right above. And we, it was casting shadow on the ground just by the oh Milky Way. It was just unbelievable. And the guy only had a small, and the guy had a small, I think it was a Tesco, two and a half inch telescope in the back oh, of the need. truck. <laughs> I saw things in a two inch telescope that I haven't seen in a 20 inch here telescope here. Uh, it was unbelievable. Uh, wow. The, and, and I'm so happy because that project is going to come to to Fru, uh, fruition. Uh, it was supposed to start beginning of 2020, but with pandemic and all, the project was put on, on hold. So hopefully next year or the year after, it will become a, a reality. And I'm sure as hell I was going to go there and install all the equipment there. Oh, yeah. <laughs> just, to, just to have a look at the night sky over there. <laughs> wow. That's but awesome. yeah, so observing visually is something that's always will, will be my thing. Um, and also, like I say, uh, there's thousands and thousands of opportunity to observe with the, uh, but I think the important ones is when you are you're with friends around you and you can share the experience and share your thoughts about what you see. And um, for that reason, I'm going to sing you a song about friendship. <laughs> so okay. Okay. so it's, my, it's my tradition that every time I yes. come to the Global Star Party, I will make a song. So Love here. <laughs> so you probably all know the song. I don't know if I played it before. Anyway, it's a great song about friendship.
winter, spring, summer, or fall. All you've got to do is call, and I'll be there. Yes, I will. Got a friend. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Oh, we were so saying this is the best, the best part of this star party. <laughs> <laughs> always, always music in the star party with me. <laughs> Love it. it I was singing fun. along with you. <laughs> <laughs> I was singing. I'm singing. I love that song, anyways. And it's yes, great. it's a beautiful song. Carol, Carol King. King. Carol King wrote that song. Mm -hmm. Friendship is such an important part of uh, the, you know, the astronomy community experience, you know. Oh, so. yeah. Oh, yes, it is. Okay. Well, thank you, everyone, for having me on. Thank you. Thank you very much. Norman, you take care, and thanks for sharing your uh, evening with us. Thank you. Take care. Take care. Bye-bye. All right. So uh, someone that just is with us for has just a couple of minutes where he has to leave is Dustin uh, Gibson. Uh, so, Dustin, thanks for thanks for coming on. Uh, right after this, we're going to have uh, Cesar Brolo down from Argentina on with us. But uh, definitely wanted to give you a couple of minutes here to to hang out with us. Um, uh, so it's been crazy, I imagine, at uh, OPT, and uh, um, give us a sense of what what's been happening in your world. Yeah, man, it's been uh, it's it's been wild, you know, in all all the best ways. We have a lot going on, but you know, we're also doing uh, I'm doing Thursday and Friday night streams here on Clear Skies Network, hmm. and um, so I'm getting the observatories back up and running. With um, you know, when coronavirus started, it made it exceedingly difficult to get out and uh get people out to texas and the other place we we're doing installs but um you know we're finally able to at least send myself or one person places to install some stuff and uh yeah so we've got several observatories going back live and that's exciting because this is man i live for this stuff these oh, yeah. parties every yeah. week it's like this is this is all I want to talk about every day, which is why we bought OPT so we could just talk about this all day, every day. <laughs> all day long. And yeah, it's all we do is the nine to five, and then you leave there and you just talk about it more. Yeah, that's and, right. Uh, and I look to see if you're on, so I can come on here and talk about it more. Oh, uh, it's great to have you come on. So I know but, you've been really, really buried and busy. So, but uh, it's awesome to to see you, and uh, you're looking well. You're looking, you know, you're looking. Uh, uh, rested and everything. A, a lot of us have been <laughs> have been working like crazy uh, trying to keep up. Uh, but uh, um, you know, I know that uh, OPT has uh, has been uh, super busy. So we have, yeah. And, and Explore Scientific, I, I know that um, you know Explore Scientific is leading the charge as well. You know, getting out there and and being We're here. We're doing our right best. <laughs> Yeah, doing you're, our best. you're committed. Yeah, every time I turn this thing on, you know, I'm like, he's on here for hours and hours, and it's it's so good to see. And I, you know, I, I see a lot of people on here. Thank you. I try to pop in or at least have this running in the background when I'm working, and um, I hear a lot of people thank you, and I'm so glad because I mean, it is a monster commitment um, to be on. Inspired by you. Yeah. Inspired <laughs> by you. So thank you. Thank you yeah, for. No, yeah. I, uh, I, I love that you're doing it. And the, the people that you bring on here, it's like, you know, this is the best. People ask me why I love this so much. It's like, man, I'm surrounded by all my heroes, you know, all the time. And, and you bring half of them here on the show. So <laughs> it's like everywhere you look, you've got these Incredible people group literally of people. shaped. Yeah. yeah. These people have shaped this industry from yeah. like the software we use to the telescope designs to every aspect of it. It's like, it's such, I mean, the stories are unbelievable. And so that's why I leave it running is like it's just hearing people's stories, hearing how they got to where they are or what brought them into being this defining character in an industry that has shaped all of us. Yeah, it's like that's that's an important story and one that needs to be told because it's literally changing perspective on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. And very few things can do that for the positive.
So, um, no, man, I, I absolutely love, very much appreciate you doing this all the time. Thank you, Dustin. Thank you. Yeah. Well, well guys, uh, really thank you also for letting us uh, uh, broadcast on Clear Skies Network oh, as well, because that's a, it's a, it's an honor to be a part of that. So very cool. Uh, yeah. Very yeah. Cool. Any of our avenues, any of the vehicles we can create to help push this message forward, man. That's that's what uh, that's what this needs. We got to get this out. I tell people we're not going to stop until every kid I meet is taking better images than we all are. You know. So. <laughs> Do you uh, have more kids on yeah. on your show now? Uh, we do. We, we bring, uh, you know, I, we're actually, I've been doing a lot of stuff, just one-on-one -on -one helping mm -hmm. kids, you know, kind of like get into the system and learn the first steps. I mean, you really have to start with the basics because, it, you know, exposure is not a word that most people understand unless you've been in photography. So it just starts with the basics and then we go from there. But I think it's just that confidence building because yeah. astronomy is intimidating. Um, it can be intimidating to all. It's intimidating yeah. to me still. Um, so I think starting with the basics and we take the, we do OPT university for our staff every single day. They have to go through 30 minutes of training every single day. Um, and then I bring the OPT university stuff, that conversation and just try to, you know, push that out and say like, we can do this. Not only can we do this, it's not as hard as everybody kind of makes it seem. We can do this together. Oh, sure. Sure. Well, I, I know that your programs are successful and uh, you're carrying along the entire community with you. So you're doing a great job, Dustin. And thank you. I very much admire what you're doing, too. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I yeah. wish I could hang out longer, man. I'm so sorry. I know that it, things will things will settle out in a bit. We just got these uh, these releases this week. And so, um, you know, okay. we're we're buried. But okay. all the best kind of problems in the world. So, right. Hey, and thank you to everybody that's here for everything you're doing. Love the stories. I'll keep this running in the background. Um, yeah. Thanks again, thanks, Scott. Thanks, Dustin. Take care, man. Yeah. All We're right. We're going to let him get out of there without singing a song, right? <laughs> oh, I should I should say really quick, Jason. Man, you got yeah, Jason in today. the vast reaches. That's right. He's with us Jason tonight. So. I, I think I was probably happier about it than you were, Jason. <laughs> thanks, man. That's yep. all that yeah, he got an astronomy picture of the day. To, it was today, right? Yeah, yeah, it's running today. It's awesome. Yes. Okay, so we'll get to that. Uh, we'll, we'll have you up next, uh, Jason. Uh, uh, right now, we're going to go to Caesar in Argentina. Uh, he is, uh, he's been up late. It's, of course, later over there. And um, we'd like to, uh, to check out what he's doing. So what do you got for us tonight, Caesar? Well, only we will have a cloudy, cloudy night conversation because um, it's still cloud. It's still cloudy uh, now, mm -hmm. and uh, I think that that uh, I don't have chances uh, here to, to have a, a clear night. But well, okay, uh, uh, we only we can talk about astronomy. Sure, you know. <laughs> Um, this week we have uh, 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 interesting, interesting uh, activities uh, in our company, in our business, uh, because uh, you know uh, the, the, the total eclipse is coming to Argentina uh, yeah. in, in less that uh, or near that one month, and um, and one of, of the things that we sell is, is, is the film of polymer, uh, polymer with, uh, with a mylar from United States. And uh, this time we don't have time to, to make the support for the filter for telescopes. And only we, we sell uh, the film and we are talking a lot with, the, with, the, with the amateur astronomers uh, about how to prepare the, the support for for the um, for the the filter uh, because we are really concerned to to that the people that buy this film make a very safe support and all people now in Argentina that uh, that buy us uh, buy us uh, uh, this film is hand make a handmade. Uh, uh, proper filter for this their telescopes, and of course all the time we are we are uh, giving support about how to to make proper uh, support for the film, 
mm -hmm. and this week, uh, last week was was very very easy because they say okay, we don't have time to make the the, the you know the, the any uh, every support for every type of telescope because uh, now it's impossible for us, but we are talking a lot by Skype or you know WhatsApp or all video call that okay is your filter okay show me okay oh no you need you to use this or this or it's safe in this or you know um, um, this is our our work uh, in the last two weeks but of course that we are giving support of everyone that, that have this film and need to make for their telescopes or binoculars make a proper and safe uh, um, support, not support, sorry, is, is it a, uh, my English, I'm sorry. It, it's um, the, the, the right, the right uh, um, uh, system to, to support the film over the, over the telescopes. Right. Maybe yeah, like it's a, not like support a, the, yes, sure. The holder, right. The holder, yes. Yes. Um, and uh, this was part of our work in this week. And um, uh, well, and we are every every day we are working more because we this this year we manufactured uh, with the film the, the solar shades. Yeah. And um, you know the we we was very. Very concerned in concerned in the in the quality of the of the mounting, very of the mounting of, of the, the films. Yes, not, the film itself know, is very important too. Yes, because it, maybe the, the people say, okay, it's just only paper. No, but you need something like that when you when you start to manufacturing something, like, and you, it's very important to to see the quality or you know it's. Well, you, you, you have the experience uh, of distribution of solar rays in, in the great eclipse, eclipse of uh, 2000, uh, uh, 2016 was the, the, the great American, last great American eclipse. Yes. 2016. 2017. 17, 17, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we are here with, uh, for our next uh total uh, eclipse and uh the the fortunately for only for local tourists or or uh, countries near to argentina only uh it's open but we don't know uh, uh, uh nothing about if for another countries it will be open but of course that with only one month yeah only only we know that we can go to the place uh, uh, and this is, uh, we don't have more information than this. Uh, actually, yes, we are going to Patagonia uh, and we are preparing the, the, all the, trans the transmissions for, for the clips. I'm talking with the local TV to make a, a, a transmission for for you know, for uh, 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 internet and TV, uh, we are working in, in in our own equipment about cameras, telescopes, and I prepare all for to go to Patagonia, North Patagonia. I uh, have my yes, Tony. Sorry. Caesar, uh, Caesar, you you will have the internet connection there. Will you have a good internet con connection? <laughs> well, this is something that we are talking with the authorities of uh, the of the place because yeah. we are talking to to uh, because we need a good internet connection in this yeah. place. But you know that that the, the towns are very small and you know maybe they have internet, but you you need internet. You need we will need internet in an open area yeah. near to the to the town, to the small towns. Um, I, I don't know how they can uh, they can bring us, but you know uh, we are we are talking that 
really we need a, a, a very good internet connection. Last year in San Juan, we have an amazing internet connection. Yeah. But the problem was that we we have uh, uh, the problem of, you know, when you have the, the password and you don't need to talk to anybody. <laughs> and I don't know why. <laughs> Everybody people, knows. <laughs> yes, is it why? For come on, it's secret. It's a password. The way, the way that you make it go like crazy is you say, "Look, don't tell anyone." But this is yeah. yeah, yes, please don't tell. <laughs> yes, we yes. <laughs> everybody, or everybody, yes. Three thousand people transmitting on the internet. Come on, my family. Yes, look, this this eclipse is wonderful. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Collapse yeah. for everyone, of course. Right. Uh, but um, this situation, comparing with uh, our last situation in in San Juan last year, that was like a Lula Palusa of of eclipse, because it was a, a really huge, huge party with a, a, a lot of different points. In each point, you have between seven thousand from 3,000 to 7,000 people in in each node or need each uh, place of, of, of observation. But of course, this year, we think in a more like official events, we think that the, the people is, uh, it, is going to only to the side of the road, um, without a, a huge event like last year uh, last year was yeah. was an amazing oh, yeah. was amazing in argentina was incredible uh, san juan province uh, uh, made a very very huge uh, event in in the in the um, part of the totality in the san juan province yeah. but this year you know the, the conditions are really really different and we are going to make a, an official event, but we don't know how yeah, you don't know how will. many people can show up for this, right? Yes, yes. Yeah. For example, the town of Balcheta, they say we will uh, close the town. We, yes, they told us that hmm. we can make everything outside the town. Come on, it's incredible. But they are really scared. This is the problem. With, the problem with this this pandemic is. Oh yeah. When the, the people is over scared, and you yes. say, Come. of course that, all, every every everyone are are uh, taking care about this, but it's bad when you have the over, over, um, you know. Uh, well, over scare or over uh, worry the people and say, come on, it's too much. Yeah. But yeah. we are working a lot for filters for, you know, uh, solar trades or ev ev everything, everything. We have a lot of work. Fortunately, I have the, the place, uh, I rented a, a place uh, for me and my family and uh, family friends. Mm. Um, we are, I have all prepared but really i miss i miss a lot of people that like you that came to argentina to know you know yeah, yeah, really yeah. If this, really i this miss a lot was this. Not, you know the pandemic yeah. was not going on i would definitely be down uh, there. totally totally yes yeah it's totally changed everything, everything yes that's right yeah well uh Caesar, I think that uh, you know you're going to be in in a very strange way involved in a very historic um, eclipse, uh, you know, and um, uh, you know I know that you will try to share uh, you know this as as well as you can with uh, you know this uh, adversity and um, you know uh, hopefully you're able to. Uh, Share it also through the internet uh, somehow, um, but of course, uh, I share not, it with yeah, you. Of course, we'll get, we'll get uh, absolutely yeah. yes, yeah. So I I'll give you when I when I have all completely uh, prepared. I'll yeah. give you the the you know the 
the address or all of them. Okay. For okay. The, you have, yes, you, if, if we can, you are the first one because, it, <laughs> yes, sure, yes, cool. yes. Oh. And uh, okay. yes, we are awaiting the, 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 the quality of the signal or all that this, these people can prepare. It will be a, 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 in a good way, but you know that we are awaiting for this. I, uh, and I understand it may not happen for that way, but uh, uh, maybe after, if we are unable, unable to connect live, um, then uh, you know, I'll certainly turn to you to, uh, uh, we can rebroadcast after, after the event. So that's, that's also possible. But uh, we wish you good luck. You know, we wish you good luck. Thank we know you. it's going to be a lot of work uh, getting there. Uh, the you. total eclipse that happens on December 14th. Uh, what time will be totality? What time is totality? Uh, How many time? Or? No, no. What, what time will it be? What time will it be uh, on December 14th? Uh, at what time? At, at 12 uh, at noon, but I don't remember exactly sorry around noon okay I, I don't, yes it's at noon it's at noon sorry that i don't remember exactly exactly the, that's all right uh, the time um i know that in balcheta we have uh, one of the the times uh, yeah. uh, long times longer times uh, maybe a little more in the in the in the west you have a little more time but we are near to the to the more longer time of totality in in this town of Valcheta. but you know the problem is that they this is time this is towns are really really small because yeah. it's a place it's a place like it maybe you in in, in united states uh have a, a line over arizona and the desert and you have a really little little small towns. tiny towns right yes and Remember we have a bunch of them here. Are, yes, and and we are Argentina. <laughs> we are only in the entire country. But for yeah. people, when today that I, I listened that, uh, that about the the quarter months, um, many many times I I hear from my customers different problems, and sometimes I don't uh, understand why they told me about problems with the you know that touch sometimes touch the counterway touch the, the tripod or sometimes yeah. they tell me that maybe uh, touch, uh, touch something of the telescope because the problem is that we have a latitude from 66 yeah. in the south right to 21 in north and in the same the same equator mode that you sell is for different people in different places and this is, uh, and we are only, we are only 50 millions in Argentina. It's a very, very large country, and we have, we are only 50 millions, uh, maybe too, less. Many people. <laughs> it's yes. empty. Yes, we are. Like, we are a lot of people live in Buenos Aires, of course, but uh, Patagonia is really empty. The distance are far, 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 all is far, far away. And it's very interesting because you drive a lot and you can see nothing. <laughs> <laughs> but that's good. That astronomers like that. <laughs> so we love this because they have a, an amazing. <laughs> yes, yes. Right. I, I just I choose a house in a, in a San Antonio Este. Sorry that my, my speech is too long. Sorry. Uh, but it's a place it's a place that i i love to enjoy because the the, uh, the milky way in this part of near to the sea and yeah. mix up with a, a, a kind of desert the landscape and you have a, a clear skies that are amazing and you know when you have eclipse you have nights with uh with a new moon and it's the best time to to, to have a, a, a really uh, to enjoy places to to make photography or something or only to watch the sky like like talk uh, our friends uh, just because it's, it's really really I I um, uh, I miss to to watch the sky 
Yes. Uh, because, come on, it's, it's amazing. Yeah, we were all talking about how we need our time under the stars, you know, how that makes us feel better. But, Absolutely. Um, well, I'd like to uh, 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 make a big shout out for Jason Gonzal, The Vast Reaches. He's, uh, he's with us tonight. Uh, today, he got an astro NASA Astronomy Picture of the Day. Um, and uh, so that's a uh, big congratulations. Um, how many, uh, is this your first time? It's not your first time to get. Yeah, this is, yeah, it's the first one I've gotten. So. It's the first one. It wow. is, yeah. Good Lord. Well, we're very, we're very honored to, uh, to have you on, uh, on the show uh, today. And uh, I, I can't, personally, I can't believe this is your first one. So, because you've had so many amazing images, but uh, uh, it's fantastic. Well, so yeah, I've been I've been telling people it's not for a lack of trying. I've definitely right. um, definitely right. put there a lot of images in the ring for that one. But you know anybody that's kind of grown up, um, you know, in the internet age is is familiar with that web page. And um, oh yeah, it's famous. You know, if you're this is the pinnacle astronomy. That's you know that's that's one page that's been through this hobby. You know for you know from the beginning. And it's funny, you know, you look at that page and the, the layout, the, the look of that page hasn't changed since they first published, uh, you know, an APOD. They, right. um, they kept that same format the entire time, but, you know, it's uh, succinct, succinct and it gets the message, you know, across. So I guess it, it works. Um, but yeah, it's exciting. Um, you know, any, any astrophotographer will, will tell you, um, you know, that's one of those things that you don't, you always like to see your image up there someday. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, so, it's like having your, your uh, for a rock and roll person, have your picture on the cover of the Rolling Stone, you know, I mean, it's, it's the, yeah, it's, cool. it's the, uh, it's the top. So, um, uh, the, see, I don't have much of an acceptance speech plan, but <laughs> we can, well, uh, we can uh, you could, uh, you could talk about the, uh, the, this image of the soul nebula that you did and, um, uh, you know, um, yeah, I, I realize you don't really need, you know, the image speaks for itself. I mean, it is stunning. Uh, um, uh, yeah, uh, I want to share my screen here and all that. Please do. Here, and I'm going to share the link so that everybody else can see this. All right, is my screen coming across? Yes, sir. Okay, so this is the image. Um, so I actually uh, created this one as a somewhat of a Halloween image because I thought, uh, and I think I shared it actually on your stream here a couple weeks ago, but I just, um, I took a larger image of the, the Soul Nebula and cropped it down to this, this little um, crop in the very center. Um, you know, as I was processing this, I started seeing a face staring back at me and uh yeah i mean a lot of people people see all kinds of stuff in here um the two most common are um this face you know seen there in red and, and then the indian subcontinent down here at the bottom um there's a pretty striking resemblance to india um you know straight up through you know nepal and the himalayas up there you can kind of visualize it all but um, yeah, so I started seeing this this face staring back at me when I was when I was processing it, and I just thought it was a cool crop, um, not a real common rotation or orientation to look at the soul nebula in. Um, I started kind of seeing all these things pop out at me. Right. Well, but, you know, they, uh, the they first, when I first just... looked at it, I, the the the, the uh, nebulosity that's kind of at, at an angle up there, and then this kind of brighter one that's off to the side it looked like some sort of you know alien kind of uh uh face you know the, it was was the first uh impression that i got from it but then yeah, afterwards then the, i was able to see the the uh, uh the face that you were talking about some people see a bat there some people see a singer sewing machine <laughs> you know it's just the list goes on but it's funny when you you know remove the stars from an image all of a sudden 
your eye and your brain just starts fabricating these these patterns and, and shapes. Right. Uh, but I can uh, share the larger version of that image. That little uh, that little finger sticking down in the lower right hand side. It kind of reminds me of a a hand pointing down with a finger. Yeah, yeah. Let's see that over here. So this is actually the uh, the full frame for my telescope of that shot. So you can see how much I cropped down into the center sure. there. And this is more recognizable as the, the Sol Nebula, uh, the cent center column of the Sol Nebula. Mm -hmm. That's beautiful. With and, and I think the... Uh, Next image over is with the with the stars overlaid. Stars. So you can kind of see how the stars were taken out of that. Right. Well, it's spectacular. That's all yeah, I can thanks. say. Well, what is your combined exposure here, Jason? Uh, this one ran about uh, 36 hours. I, I ran, I, I've kind of settled on shooting, trying to shoot 12 hours of narrowband data per channel. So this was taken in sulfur, hydrogen, and oxygen. It's and, beautiful. Uh, map that way. And the way you process your images too, they, you know, they're not, uh, they don't look over processed. They don't look, um, you know, too hard edged, but yet there's so much detail in them, you know, uh, so your eye really can spend a ton of time, you know, going from one tiny feature to the next. Um, yeah, you know, that's kind of, you know, that ends up being the balance, right? You yeah. Know, I can't scroll around on that thing. Okay. I know. Look, look at all the, I mean, there's so much star formation going on here. Beautiful. Yeah, that really dark nebula is that is that is that a hole through the nebulosity or is that oh, are you talking about this dense, dark yeah yeah that's actually a i mean don't quote me on it because i'm not positive but i think that's just a, a a dust cloud hanging in front of the nebula kind of blotting mm -hmm. out what's behind it you can kind of see that looks like some, an ink blot. Yeah, David Eicher might know. I don't know. You can kind of see some, you know, oh, texture yeah. in there, which makes it look yeah. like it's a, a dust cloud. It does. There's that uh, hand sticking up, pointing up. <laughs> that looks like an index finger. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, thanks for... Uh, um, Thanks for the love, everyone. And we got you. a good response. So it's awesome to, for you to share this. Uh, you know, to that. get the chance to share an APOD uh, with someone that we know uh, like you as J uh, Jason is really cool. Uh, Andrew Corkill is asking, "What prompted you to remove the stars? Is it a technique?" He says, this uh, is "Yeah, I generally do before. that now when I'm processing." Um, processing these narrow band images and it it just um, it helps be able to, to process the uh, you know all the various brightness levels in the nebula to kind of bring out the minute contrasts um, when you don't have the stars present because if you work with the stars in the, in that in mm -hmm. that context you can end up pushing the stars into into some sort of uh, ugly territory so i just i just prefer to take them out and work the nebula and then and then overlay them back in you know to the finished product sure and then that way you can kind of click them on and off and you know depending on your tastes uh, which way you like it you can you can work with either one it's awesome i think it's kind of a little bit ironic is you know that you know as an astrophotographer your your image that is uh, selected for a pod has no stars in it but I don't, they don't really pick many starless images for uh, for a pod so right right well congratulations man that's a, a big deal. I do have something else to show here um 
mm -hmm. that I was working on. Um, I don't have any live imaging tonight because it's been it's been cloudy, but sure. I took this the other day. I thought this was cool. This was a animation of the uh, sunspot group. That's oh, very nice. On the sun right now. And actually, let me look at this other video because this one doesn't zoom in. It's a little bit easier to see, but. Um, so this is that uh, sunspot that just rounded the corner of the sun and is tracking around and is now reaching the opposite side. I shot this on the 4th, which is almost a week ago now. But you can see all the texture in the, uh, in the chromosphere. This is 45 minutes of movement and it gets to the end and it just uh, repeats. So that's why it kind of jerks. You can actually see the sun the rotation of the sunspot around the sun there. I, I see. Oh, excellent. That's great. Then I had this other one that uh, zoomed in a little bit on it. That's got that 152 never, never disappoints with the, uh, <laughs> The solar resolution. Yeah, it's it's amazing what you do with it. Look at that. Yeah. Oh my goodness. I'm waiting for the oh. uh, AR AR two hundreds coming, right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'm pushing for it. Right. I'm pushing for it. That's AR beautiful, man. Wow. Jason, you are you are a master at this stuff. It's great. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thanks for having me. Thanks, man. Yeah. Love sharing it. Yeah. We love it too. Thank you. Yeah. So what's next on your horizon? What's, what are you going to be shooting uh, or going after next? Or do you even know? Uh, well, I've got, oh, I've got so many. <laughs> I've got I mean, no less than 45 deep sky images that I've captured and still have yet to process okay that far behind in this stuff because i generally capture every every time i can sure i end up running out of time uh, doing the, the editing so that's something I, I always have it's a little bit of a weight on my shoulders trying to get through all that and it's just been stacking up and stacking up well i think you kind of have to work that way i mean if you get the sky for it you got to shoot right and and yeah uh, but at some point it becomes a little ridiculous when i look at the mountain of hard drives that I filled up. Right. I'm just one right. person is hire a team to process or something. Yeah. Right. But yeah, yeah. I've been trying to, you know, that, uh, that have a team that does, you know, all this other work. So, but, uh, you know, the, the sun's been active again. So I've been trying to get out doing that and, uh, you know, the plant trying to get my last shots and on, on Mars in. So just been, uh, busy doing that stuff and, all the while capturing the deep sky stuff in the background and uh, never finding the time to process it. Right. You'll get to it. You'll get to it. I think that's, that is really, that's gotta be, uh, uh, that image has gotta be a source of personal pride and, uh, it is a remarkable, uh, image for anybody to look at. So it's really cool. Thank you, man. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so um, uh, Jerry, I think that you're up next here. Okay, I, uh, it's cloudy here. It's, it's, the clouds have finally come. I was did talking it, to Jason did earlier. Did it cloud over the entire world? Is that what happened this time? <laughs> that was actually, I was talking to Jason. The last week well, has been beautiful, you know, so we have to pay for that at some point, you know. Yeah, yeah. We've got all this well, time Richard, to image. Richard's got sky, so that's cool. Yeah, I, I, uh, I was going by this clear skies chart. I didn't actually go out. I didn't. Uh, I'm on the observatory, but I didn't. I was on earlier, but I didn't try to open it up to look at the sky. Actually, I, I looked at the. Uh, so it might be a little better, but I did that this this morning, thinking it was going to be good to do some. I've been doing a week long, uh, every morning doing the some lunar imaging early in the morning mm -hmm. from like two to to five o'clock, depending on what day it was. And uh, so I can show one of the images that I've processed. Uh, 
Absolutely. And it's a little bit different. Typically, when you do lunar imaging, um, you know, you, you gear up the, uh, the system. You, you, you tailor it to do planetary by having a very long focal length, you know, of high focal ratio of right F20 to maybe F30 if your skies will support it. Mm -hmm. And uh, but what I've been doing at the MSRO, we've got it configured for deep sky. So we've got a deep sky astro camera on there. It's not a planetary video camera. And the focal ratio is F5.1 on the 165 uh, telescope, which is a six and a half inch refractor that we have as a main instrument. And uh, so I've been playing around with this uh, image that I took. I've been taking full disk lunar images. So it's just one full frame, no mosaic. And I was trying to push the limits to see what kind of resolution I would get in terms of how small a craters I can see on the moon with that setup. You know, typically you do, you know, close-ups of the lunar surface and you do mosaics and patch it all together. But I wanted to, I wanted to get away from that and just push the limits on the system and my skill to see what I could pull out of these images. And of course we had great seeing this past week. So I was able to do quite a bit and get some of the best full disk images I've been able to get so far. And the zoom panel kind of gives you a feel for it, but I want to, I want to zoom up on can you see that okay? Yes. Uh, I'm going to zoom up here on Copernicus. Actually, I've got another image that I can show also that's probably better. Um, well, Jerry, what, what is it? Uh, to get this kind of high resolution, you're shooting more than a full, I mean, you've you got this crop down, okay? Yeah, well, so this is the full disk right here. This is actually not even the full frame. This is like... Right. Uh, this is like three, uh, about 0 0.8 by 0 0.7 by 0 0.7 degree field of view. Uh, actually, it's a little smaller than that. This is like, well, that's a half a degree for the moon. So it's like 0 0.7 by 0 0.7 degrees. The full frame is 1.3 by 0 0.9 degrees is the full frame of the camera. So I've cropped, I've done a region of interest that, that encompasses the moon a little closer. But again, this is still the, the full this, uh, deep sky camera, it's a 16 megapixel camera. All right, and the image scale is about 0.9 arc seconds per pixel, which is okay for deep, it's great for deep sky. You're basically critically sampled for deep sky, but it's, it's very poor for planetary imaging. And uh, so you, because you don't, you can't pull out all the details when you're doing lucky imaging and you're stacking hundreds of frames, you can pull out tons of detail when you have that, that small of a, image scale like 0.2 arc seconds per pixel but again i wanted to see what i could get with just a full disk image and process it so i'm gonna i'm gonna zoom in on this and show you start to show you what kind of stuff i get now i'll show you an example of what okay size these craters are oh, God. so you can keep zooming in and zooming in yeah right? yeah, yeah, yeah more detail we looked so, at the image earlier and uh yeah and it was it, to me it, it reminded me of some of the gigapixel um, images right. that uh, was being done at Microsoft Research. You know where they they would start off by being across the bay from, you know this in Seattle. You know and uh, um, and and zooming in on like the windows of the Space Needle. Or right. Something, you know. Right. So. so for example, this uh, this crater. This is the main one is called Fouth, F-A-U-T-H. That's Fouth right there, this larger one. That's Fouth A. And these two, this is Fouth B. This, see these two craters right here? I see my cursor. Um, hopefully right next. This crater is two miles in diameter. Okay. And you can see hints of craters that are less than two miles in diameter over here. So the ejecta blanket, they came off of Copernicus when the impact happened. That's what all this hummocky material is all around the crater. Yeah. And then it threw off chunks. It created these all these little craters here, all these little craterlets. You can see them over here, too. So, for example, this crater right here is less than two miles in diameter, okay, which is uh, pretty close to the – that's pretty much the limit of the resolution of the pixel scale. 
So I was able to pull out all the details that you could possibly get out of this camera. And you can see this chain of craterlets here. They're three, three, four miles in diameter. Some of them are maybe less than three miles, but that's that whole chain of craters there is like three to four miles in diameter. So let me, let me, I'm going to slowly zoom out so you can get a feel for the, well, I'm going to go all the way in. That's all the way in. I'm going to slowly pull it out. You can see, like you said, it's like these, you keep going and going and going and going and going and going. And there it is. <laughs> Crazy. So, and then let me show you, this is a cool part with Tycho. It looks really cool. And then the straight wall. Let me pull these. Uh, so there's the straight wall. Let me zoom up. This is the setting sun shining on the straight Look at wall. That. So that's it right there. That is crazy good. And uh, now and then, it, it gives a sense of scale. What? How? How tall or how? So what is the straight? The wall? straight wall. The straight wall is I think like eighty kilometers long and then the slope it's a it's it's not as steep a slope as it appears it's a like a 30 a 20 degree slope okay 15 to 20 degree slope but so it's, it's like, like a it's half good. a kilometer it's like 500 meters tall okay so what we're seeing is basically a slope that's 500 meters tall i think uh that's got the sun shining on it so yeah. and then here's a the crater Tycho with a central peak right there. That's kind of oh cool. God. Look at that. That's a really dramatic uh, view of it. And uh, let me pull back just a little bit so you can see. And then you can see over here across the Terminator, you can see all these little crater rims that pop out. All these little right. peaks right here. You know, right. that's all that tiny little dot. That's kind of the limit of the resolution of this thing. It shows that light spot on top of that peak like here uh here over here he's got these little peaks picking up into the sun the last you can imagine standing on this peak and looking at the sunset on the moon yeah gazing out towards the sun is stefan del pra what would like he wants to know which camera you're using to get these images so i'm using a deep sky camera it's a 16 megapixel qhy 163 see color camera the color camera it's a color camera and so i've combined you know i'm using a bin one of course to get the highest resolution it's 0.9 arc seconds per pixel Jeez. but i've created you know the i processed the image into a monochrome image basically mm -hmm. to pull out all this detail and um and again like you get these little craterlets right here you know two, three miles in diameter. I just love looking at these things. And then there's a, another section of the moon that's that's kind of flat out here. Right. And the shadows are, this is a, the last quarter moon. So the craters look different on the last quarter. They look like dark spots instead of light spots. You know, you see mm -hmm. all these dark spots and it gets even more pronounced as it gets further on into the cycle. But, but you can see, um, you know, is that the best time to image the the moon? Is this last quarter? Well, it just depends on, eight, you know, first quarter is the most common. You see most images of the moon you'll see are first quarter or near mm -hmm. first quarter, but you rarely see it last quarter because you have to get up at three o'clock in the morning you know, <laughs> to image that. So that's right. why, on at least in uh, the Northern hemisphere, you know, so, so I guess any time, I guess, but that's when that's when you have to get up. Astronomers are, are lazy to get up at that time, I guess. So right, right. So mm -hmm. I just wanted to share that. So I've got a week's worth of I got six days worth of uh, the cycle, going from day like seventeen to twenty three days in the cycle, and I'm going to be processing all those images, and I think I'm going to turn them into a series of charts for the Lunar One Hundred. Uh, Chuck Woods Lunar 100 objects. I've been doing articles about it for the ALPO uh, yeah. newsletter, the uh, the Lunar Observer newsletter. I do every two months. I do an article, and the last series of articles have been about the Lunar 100 Chuck Woods uh, list of lunar features. And I'm probably going to turn this into a, a chart, a bunch of charts that point out all those different features. Oh, here's here's another uh, neat crater to look at. Uh, it's uh, Eratosthenes or Eratosthenes. I call it Eratosthenes or Eratosthenes uh, is the name of this crater. 
And uh, actually, I've got the chart here. Let me let me zoom out. So here it is, right here. Here's Eratosthenes. All right, that's on the ver that's on the um, virtual lunar virtual moon atlas program I used to to identify craters. But that's this crater right here. And this is a great chart because it it uh, it it gives you a good idea of all the names that are on the plant on the uh, of the craters on the moon. And I, so this image that I've taken it will show every named every every item in the database in this chart program. So for example, so you can see. Let me go back to this. Um, So there's Fouth, okay, on the chart, and you can see the two craters there. And this is Fouth B, uh, right there, okay, which is the second one of that. Fouth B is on the chart. It says it's two miles in diameter. That's how I know it's two miles. You all were wondering probably, how do you know it's that small? How do you know? Yeah. Yeah, and that's how I know because this chart told me. And there's a there's a way I've got another tool that you could do measurements on the moon also on your images that'll tell me how big stuff is. But uh, I wanted to share that. Um, that's the kind of work I've been doing the last week. That's what my mom always asked me. How do you know that? <laughs> how do you know? <laughs> that's right, because other people have found it out. <laughs> right. Right. Oh goodness. So Bob, you've uh, you've been uh, um, on our show all this time, and and you haven't uh, on and off. To really oh, tonight, yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. Right. It's nice to have you on. You know. Well, thank you for inviting me. I can't often get here every week, but I try to get here every few weeks, and I totally enjoy this. I really do. Um, it's I love it's you on. such a nice break. And um, thank you for having me. Um, it's it's neat to see Deep T. It's neat. Cesar, sometime I have to talk to you. What the heck you actually do in in Argentina? Um, I know kind of, but you know, I wonder that I, I have a lot of customers all over the world that do remote observing in one form or another, automated and remote. And yes. I'm not sure I've crossed paths with you yet, so. Um, that's why I'm curious. Uh, anyway, um, thank you for having me on. Yeah. Uh, we're, we're kind I, of at the part of our, um, our, of the global star party where it's just kind of open to share and free and form, free form at this point. So you guys want to have any kind of conversations DT. I saw the, uh, what was the NASA certificate that I saw that you posted? Uh, that was of uh, history resource campaign. Very cool. Awesome. So, uh, you know, I know that um, a lot of people are very, uh, you know, honored to have anything associated with NASA. I mean, Jason, Jason's uh, NASA astronomy picture of the day is there, which is really cool. Um, I flashed that up. I hope that didn't disturb anybody. I just, when you started, I put it up there just so people could see it. Yeah, it's cool. It's great. Yeah, let's, let's show, show it again. Show it again. That was cool. oh, I, it's not on my browser anymore. I just uh, just search for it. APOD. I think is all I need. It. Yep, there it is. So, share what? Share screen. Go to my browser. Come on, click. There we go. One. Why isn't it showing? Oh, it's right here. This should show. Um, it's a black square here. But let's see what happens. Is that showing? Uh, it's showing. Yeah. There it is. And at the bottom, there it is, Jason Wenzel. That's right. Yep. That's pretty amazing. But the this is the key. And you're right. This this APOD website has remained constant for so long. Oh my goodness. Jerry sure. Bunnell, there he is. That's the guy. And we we see him at a lot of uh, of uh, you know, conferences and so forth. Yeah, I've been lucky enough to talk to Jerry uh, a couple of times uh, about, he's about so, the work. He's he so does. enthusiastic, you know. Mm -hmm. 
look at the in going to his page is probably pretty good too now i i'm going to take up a, a few seconds of everybody's time to tell you that there's a service pack on the ascom platform that's out that just yeah. came out last week thanks yeah. to um peter simpson also there are two videos on here that have replaced the older one from darren and i can't remember his last name star stuff in australia one is a live demonstration of the new alpaca, new ish alpaca technology by the people at Optech and Simon Tang at Woodland Hills, and also Simon. They're, they're both captures from live streams. The other one is a totally comprehensive view from square one all the way up to the current of universal connectivity for astronomical devices. That's what ASCOM's all about, is a universal. And now it's truly platform independent and language independent connectivity between programs and the devices. And this goes through the whole thing. Um, you can, you know, kind of, I guess I probably, that probably cut that off, huh? Oh, well. Anyway, um, it's, it's right there. And that's ascom-standards.org if you want to see it. So I'm going to be digging into that stuff deep here moving over to alpaca here soon bob so. it's pretty cool if especially if you want um you know devices that don't have usb connections that's was my big thing is get rid of usb having <laughs> now you can afford to have a little baby web server and a wi-fi my router my 30 dollar router has uh, i'll let it uh, you know anyway oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah so uh and if i go back here as a little quick no, that's not right. This one. Here we go. Can you see this again? Is this showing? Let me see. Is it showing a website? Yes. What do you see? It's not see a black square, desktop. right? I see your whole desktop. Yeah. My whole desktop? Hold on. That's weird. Let me try this again. All right. I'm going to move this here and move Zoom to the other monitor and see if I can share it like that. Okay, now I see it has my whole desktop. What's this? Nope, I'm not, I don't know why this isn't working. One more time, I'm sorry, and I won't bore you anymore. Uh, shoot, this is not right. Nope. All right, well, I'm gonna share my whole desktop then, because yeah, that's, that's okay. all it's letting sure. me do. How's this, you see my web browser here? Yeah, yes. you can maximize your browser. Yeah, that's, that's what I'll do. I'll maximize this out. All right. Now, of course, it looks weird because this isn't written for a high def entire monitor. But the idea, Jerry, is go to the developer section here. And everything about Alpaca starts here. Mm -hmm. Introduction to Alpaca. And don't let this Windows stuff fool you. You don't need it. It's You can do everything without it. Right. And there's this and more things and the API is documented. And so everything's there. We've, there's quite a lot of activity in this area that's occurring right now. And it is occurring. And I don't know why I don't see my uh, menu here of, of uh, this is irritating. I do, have a, I do have a question, Bob, about the uh, general driver development under okay. the Ascom platform. And that's uh, the templates that are available for doing the uh, server version of the driver are, are difficult. <laughs> well, the server is a difficult updates. thing. I mean, yeah. they did the best they could possibly do. And Rick, Rick Burke and Peter and myself can help you. But okay. it's difficult. But you don't need that anymore. You yeah, that's don't what I was have to ask. do that's that. What I, that's what I'm wondering. How to because what we're doing right now, we basically with our driver, we tell people to use. We did use the Poth Hub, and and of course you moved to the Device Hub already, and deprecated the Poth Hub. But that's what people have been using to connect multiple clients to our driver. And that's clunky. Yeah. Yeah. So that's so, why we started down the path of doing a server development on the Ascom driver. But again, it's been a little difficult. If you're not really good with Visual Studio, it can punk you out pretty quick. I mean, it, it takes a fair level of skill to do it. There have been a lot of um, successes doing it, 
but it's not for everybody. I get it. And so the, the place to go for info on this, and I don't, again, I don't know why I can't get my browser to show, but if this is showing, do you see my browser now? Yeah, it's got the groups. Uh, group yeah. Okay, so it's the there. ASCOM developer yeah. group here. Yeah. That is the place, and you can get help there. There's lots of activity. There's people constantly doing things. There's a bunch of people doing alpaca-based things, and if you use, you know, the you don't even you don't need .NET. You don't. I mean, you can do it in Python. You can do it in whatever. Uh, so right, right. Uh, uh, it's what did I just shot myself in the foot here? How do I get rid? Okay, I see. So that's that's okay. uh, that's what the future looks like uh, is uh, platform independent yeah. development. And you what- you can write it and run it on Windows or on a Raspberry Pi. You you can put the whole thing in your mount. Yep. Right yep. with a with a Wi-Fi antenna, yep. and today's. You only have to write the mount part. You don't have to write anything on Linux, anything on the Mac, anything on Windows. Well, I don't know. On on Linux, there are already several, two at least, um, uh, HN Sky and what's uh, Patrick Chevalli's Planetary? Carte du Ciel. Carte du Ciel, yep. Both of those will talk straight straight to your mount. No yeah, Windows yeah. needed, no com, no dot net, no browser, no nothing. nothing. It's talk straight to your Wi-Fi enabled mount with Alpaca on it. And anything running on Windows goes through the middleware that's already out there that's part of 6.5 platform and boom. So you could run the sky, tell the sky to connect to an ASCOM mount. It comes up as an ASCOM mount, you connect to it and it goes through the middleware and then out over the airways to your Wi-Fi enabled mount. Mm-hmm. Boom. It's done. So you don't have to write for Windows. You don't have to write on, on the Mac. You don't have to write on on um, Linux. Just the little um, microprocessor with its own little web server and REST library, and you're done. So that's really the future, and that's, you know, you can credit Peter Simpson with the technology on that. It's phenomenal. I think, uh, yeah, we're, we're definitely, I don't want to give anything away with our product. No, but that's we're fine. definitely moving that way. Well, <laughs> the universal connectivity is the key. You know, not having that is a killer. And the really tough part of it all is cameras. Yeah, that's right. where it's a mess yeah. it, for a lot of reasons. And the biggest reason is trying to get enormous amounts of data from point A to point B. That's really the killer. And, um, you know, it, it's one of the things that is already there on a couple of cameras is the stacking that is oh. inside the camera yeah, right. for CMOS. That's really important because now when you ask for a 20 minute image, you're not taking 20 one minute images and trying to transmit, you know, all right, that data, of data gigabytes right. of data over your wire and then stacking it on the computer. That's like the old days when they had unbuffered cameras and they had to, you know, anyway. So that's a big one. And well, then once, smart once stacking can, is. Yeah, hmm? once they can do that with planetary images, that would be the awesome application. Uh, to where they where you can actually select the planetary images it's like, like it's, SharpCap it's can like do running, now. Yeah, it's like running Registacks inside your camera. Exactly. But you know what? As cheap as the NVIDIA processors are, right? They're dirt cheap. The processors themselves are 25, 50 bucks, something like that from NVIDIA. And they're totally capable of doing stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So in the future, you can see the cameras being smart at their end and then transmitting the already selected out, stacked and aligned image as the final product. That's where I think it's going to go, but it, it's not going to work over Ethernet or Wi-Fi until that happens because of the huge amount of data that has to go from a CMOS camera into the computer. It's just totally yeah. impractical. Yeah, one of my one of my lunar videos was uh, like eight gigabytes, ten gigabytes. You know. Yeah, I mean, and that's and that's, that's lossy. That's a video, right? Mm-hmm. That is already JPEGed or you know MP4. If you're a science astronomer, that data cannot be compressed 
So now you're talking about not 10 gigabytes, but 200 gigabytes. Yeah, right. Forget it. Hey, guys, I wanted to uh, share this uh, certificate that uh, Deep T shared on our <laughs> today. So you can see that. Oh, International Astronomical that. Search Collaboration. We hereby oh. express our sincere appreciation to Deep T. Um, asteroid. Whoops. Asteroid. Asters. Okay. In recognition of valuable content. It's just the team name. Yes, it's awesome. So you you analyze images from pan stars. Congratulations. Dave. That's cool. That's great. Thank Very you. Cool. Very cool. I love it. You may not know this, but that's where I started in astronomy in 1999 and 2000 was asteroid hunting. Hmm. That was right. what put ACP on the map. Yeah. Scott right. remembers. I do remember. I remember. <laughs> BT, there's a question. Uh, someone wants to know, can anyone join your uh, your uh, astronomy club in Nepal? Or is this yeah. only for Anyone can join. Yeah. Yeah. So how do they do yeah. that? Do they contact you on Facebook or? Yeah, they can contact me on my Facebook. I will guide them. Okay. Yeah. So uh, just go to Deep T's um, Facebook page and she will, she'll help you get, uh, become a member. I'd like to be a member. Is that, is that possible? <laughs> yeah, of okay. course. You can be advisor for us. Okay. I'll be an advisor. All right, and the question to you, uh, Jason, um, um, uh, they, uh, they wanted to know the, the commentary that's with the image. Was that, did you write that or did they write that? No, the, uh, I'm not sure exactly who writes it, um, but it's one of those, it's either Jerry Bonnell or uh, Robert Nemiroff. I see. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think it says that, I think below the image commentary written by a professional astronomer. Professional astronomer, right? Yeah. So they've been doing that. Looks like I went back to archive.org and it looks like their first entry was uh, the 19th of August 2006, but um, maybe it goes before that, but I really don't see any uh, instances of that unless they oh. were on a different web you know, website been. or that's something a, that's like That's basically a 1990s look and feel for the web page. It very much is. That's right. That's right. Yeah. yeah. Let's see. Uh, what else? What other uh, questions we have here? Uh, that's, that's the level of my my web page programming. Uh, June, June 16th, 1995 was the first one. <laughs> oh, okay. That was, yeah. I that think was you right answered this already, but uh, Stefan Del Pra said that's very cool how would connecting them out via wi-fi connect to your imaging capturing software guiding etc but i think you already explained that um i i i answered something there norm is that the one you're responding yeah. to yeah. uh no that was stefan del pra oh sorry i missed that one I, i'm on the youtube feed with restream but yeah this is a facebook he, he said that's very cool oh i see how would connecting the mount by wi yeah. connect to your imaging capturing software guiding etc each device has its own connection just like today your your uh guiding camera and your imaging camera and your focuser and your filter wheel and your dome and your mount connect to an automation program such as SGP, CCD Autopilot, ACP, my thing, or they all connect in and then the, the uh, automation software or, the, or a planetarium could do it mm -hmm. and line things up and move the scope. And then, you know, there's a lot of software that will manage all of the devices in the observatory. So that connection whether it's Wi-Fi, wet spaghetti, USB, serial, it doesn't matter what it is because it's universal connectivity. The programs talk to an interface and they talk to the devices. And that's how it works today on Windows. And then that's how it's going to work on Alpaca with, with Wi-Fi or Ethernet. But as I said, trying to get images from a camera over the guiding camera would be no problem because it's small images and the rate is once a second or once every couple of seconds. So you don't want to guide a 
most mounts more often than that anyway. And they're usually little, you know, 256 by 256 images with a guide star in it, right? So that's not an issue. But a 4K by 4K chip trying to image 10 times a second, big problem. So <laughs> it's right. it's it's moving, but that's if you're taking deep sky images where you're going to take 20 minute images, 4k by 4k, and you're willing to wait 20, 30, 40 seconds for the, the image to come back. And the camera stacks the 20 images that make that up on the camera, then it's totally practical. And there are cameras out there right now. I'm not going to say who, cause it would be an advertisement, but there are already a couple of cameras that stack inside and return a single image, just like an older CCD camera would do. So then that's more, more um, practical. Excellent. Excellent. I hope that makes sense. Yeah. Richard, do you have, uh, you have some new images up there? What do you have? I do. Give me a sec here. Sure. Mm. Oh, Whoa. all right. It's windy. It's hazy, and I'm out of focus. Now, this telescope you're this using is damn good. Like, this is just uh, a one of our inexpensive 130 millimeter Newtonians, right? Yep. One of the first mm -hmm, ones. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. Just uh, just a hundred and fifty dollar entry level scope, and uh, that's the, awesome. Uh, the the cheapest cold astrophotography camera that uh, money can buy new currently at least right. uh, as far as i know it's cool and uh you know we got a little vignetting here and there we we got a couple of issues but i yeah, mean you, you know everybody upgrades their scopes a little bit too so i mean right. i'm definitely going to be putting a metal finder shoe on it because that's a bigger weakness than the stock focuser, but yeah, uh, I'm going to be working with that too because I, I want to see what it can do, and I don't feel bad and I don't take things too seriously. So it's awesome. No, it's awesome. You know, images like these. I mean, getting them on film, it, it really, I mean, truly would have been uh, a, a huge, uh, you know, effort and achievement. So you know, the, these there's nothing to be ashamed of with these images. I think it's, uh, I think it's great. And um, well, being uh, able it really to shows with... what you can do with uh, very modest investment. Yeah. So. Right. Very modest investment. It's really how, how easy it is to really get into this hobby. If you're interested, I mean, you in could do science with, with this setup. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yep. If only I knew how to do science. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> there's a guy right here that could help you <laughs> it, it, it's it's definitely nice just to know that uh i think i just lost some guiding oh well that's fine it was perfect timing you guys saw it already anyway yeah. um but yeah. uh yeah I, I just think it's nice to know that you know you you don't need to spend an arm and a leg you just need a go-to mount that can track and a decent scope that you know points straight doesn't flex around and stuff i mean you know, you can you can buy all the nice stuff, but it's it's amazing to see what you can do with less. Uh, I'm looking forward to your mounts coming back in stock one day because I'd like to see uh, what that I could actually get the whole budget down to to still be able to do something like this. Because you know, right now the uh, a couple of parts in the kit are still quite expensive, and I'd uh, I'd love to try this out on a um, an Exos two, and I'm going to be uh, looking into one of those from. Uh, somebody i've been talking to recently as well but uh yeah i'm gonna uh unshare this and send it back to the the crowd here very cool yeah the, the thing is that we we forget uh the telescope now have more uh, accessible or more uh is to, to buy from the people but we of course that we don't forget but it's, it's like like we forget that so complicated that is make a, a mirror polish mirror in the industry now uh, you can have a lot of things affordable that only 30 years ago was impossible to 
to get um, how, how the industry you know, of optics uh, it, it became more more uh, um, uh, to, to, to have uh, more affordable optics and very very high quality optics like by, by the bike but but the really it's incredible I know. I, I think of I, I I really applaud. Uh, you know, I mean, of course, to see the very best images with the with the greatest equipment is always wonderful. Um, you know, when I when I look at uh, Jason's images of the sun with uh, an AR one fifty two, when we designed that telescope, we really did not. I mean, we thought okay, people will do astrophotography with it. I didn't think that anybody would be doing cutting edge imaging with it. <laughs> I really <laughs> didn't. So it's a, uh, it's very gratifying to see that, uh, that happen. And, um, you know, by the same token, I look at what Caesar does with, uh, um, you know, very inexpensive telescopes and shows people how they can start imaging from their backyard, you know, with a modest investment. I think that's incredible. Uh, and Richard, you're doing, you're doing the same thing there tonight. So that's great. Thank you. It's really great. Mm -hmm. Yep. DT, I have to tell you, there are people on our shows that are trying to figure out how to, all of us can pitch in together to get a telescope for your astronomy club. So we're, we're going to, we're going to try to get that solved. And, uh, uh, you know, the, the, uh, um, the conversation today was, you know, what will it cost to get a donated telescope to you through customs? You know, so we need to understand what yes. that, that challenge is going to be there. So, but because um, we don't want it to be telescope, you know, things get donated sometimes to people in other countries and then it gets stuck in customs because, um, you know, someone wants to uh, uh, charge a, a lot of money just to get it through um, the government red tape there. So. We'll have to study that a little bit more. Norm Hughes says, Scott, you need to put a tab on your web page for images from users of your equipment. We're working on it, Norm. We are. Um, so it's coming. Um, and Andrew Corkill asked about uh, communicating with cameras over 5G network. I don't know. I, I don't know anything about it. So too slow. Too slow. <laughs> yep. 5G. Yep. Gigabit Ethernet is. Mm, people want those images in seconds. Yeah. And the images are honking huge. Yeah. So right. I don't know. I yeah, don't know that's wires. The thing about, that's the it, thing about uh, disk space, too. Disk space, you can eat up a disk drive in no time. And I know Jason understands that pretty well. Yes. Uh, <laughs> so you have to be smart about how you take your data. You really have to study the issue and what you're trying to get out of it. Probably buying another 16 terabyte hard drive on Black Friday. This year. <laughs> yeah. Oh. <laughs> Yeah, the Great Basin Observatory has a big disk farm, and then they have microwave internet service. So during the day, it it syncs their Dropbox to all of their students, and that still takes a fair bit of time. So, yep. Well, Deep D, I see a, a telescope in your future here. So there's there's people yes. who want to make this happen. So <laughs> it'll be very cool. Fiber. Well, gentlemen, those, I, uh, I really appreciate, uh, <laughs> 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 I appreciate um, uh, everybody joining in tonight. Um, I, you know, really uh, grateful to the audience here for participating and asking so many interesting questions. Uh, again, I want to congratulate Jason Gonzalez for his astronomy picture of the day. I think that's awesome. Uh, 
Uh, DT, congratulations to you for your certificate from NASA. That's cool as well. Um, uh, Thank you. Yep. Jerry, uh, you know, uh, thank you for showing us what's possible with, uh, you know, in high resolution lunar imaging. A lot of people tend to avoid the moon, you know, if they're astrophotographers, but, uh, yeah. you know, it's, it's really cool to, to, I mean, you can embrace the moon, even with your uh, deep sky setup. you can embrace the moon. You can embrace the moon. That's right. That's right. That's right. And uh, Caesar, thank you again for sharing your insights and everything. Hopefully, uh, we can uh, find a way to connect over the eclipse that's coming up here on December yes. 14th, you know, so that'll be very cool. Uh, yes. If you think yeah, that's hold. going to be possible, I will start, uh, I'll start really uh, promoting that and um, uh, we'll, uh, we'll ride through with you on, on the eclipse. So that's very cool. Yes. Um, and, yes, uh, my, my idea is is share the transmission with you. Well, you know, but if we have the conditions, of course that I have a, a cable for you with the image. <laughs> yeah. Just don't give out the password. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. No, no, don't share. <laughs> I, I sure. almost forgot something. What's that? Uh, well, what's running around doing all the astrophotography gear, I forgot. I uh, wanted to show the updated battery system. Oh, yeah. That's oh. right. Here we got a Pelican case. Okay. In bright uh, yellow, so you can't trip over it at night as easy. Right. Oh, I love that. We've got. Whoa. Holy smokes. 32 yeah. amp hours of lithium iron phosphate, a battery mm -hmm. management system wired in, and. You should sell these things. Add move a truck. Yeah, that's right. You should sell them. Yeah, we got a little bit of room over here to stick some capacitance over in this side. And okay. We still got to hook it up with some accessories and some outputs and stuff. But uh, I just wanted to show that because especially anybody who's doing remote operations, you can build your own if you're, you know, so inclined. It, it's not too much different than putting four batteries and a flashlight in a row. It's, you know not too much different Just or you gotta... can reach out to astro beard and maybe he'll build you one uh, yeah for, for the uh you know for those of us that <laughs> are cool to build our own I, I will definitely help walk you through uh plenty of things um i, I guess that's a possibility <laughs> i think you could probably make a living doing it so anyhow right on. yeah 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 very it's, cool it's nice to have reliable power when you're out there so that's true. Uh, my other system's kind of heavy, so I needed something in the middle. That's uh, cool. That's awesome. I have I have the big one pelican. Uh, maybe I, <laughs> I think it made you something <laughs> amazing. Uh, yes, Th this this cases are incredible. The yeah, pelican cases. Yeah. I've got a handful of them, and wow. they, they they take abuse. Uh, the uh, the portable command center behind me with the um, the big screen in the back of it and all the HF communications and 180 amp hours of lithium and solar charge controllers and VHF comms and blah 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 blah. Uh, yes. It rode in the back of the truck all the way down to Georgia through two states of torrential rain and it didn't leak. And it's got you know a two inch hole saw through it with a boat switch and you know screws holding the monitor in from the backside yes. and anything. There wasn't a drop in there. So yes, I use I like this. Them especially if you're going to do, I was considering using a, you know, an ammo box for a minute. And then I started realizing that to insulate the metal box from the electrical system was more oh. work than it was worth. And I just yeah. uh, got another Pelican. Yes. Yes. Uh, uh, all, all uh, um, when I, I go to the store parties and, or, or the eclipses, I need all very hard cases and have everything everything in in very uh, trustable uh red, red, red level, reliable uh, high quality cases and uh, we choose a pelican for to move everything yeah mm -hmm. are expensive but are the the, the only one uh, system that have a military grade because really the army uses they are they're very safe 
I learned the hard way. I built a nice little Pelican box for uh, all my Explore Scientific eyepieces. And uh, <laughs> I used the Olive Drab one. Um, yes. And at night, that's not a good idea in the grass. Oh. So, oh. so since then, all the astronomy cases are bright yellow because you can see them. Yeah. Just oh, a yeah. hint in case anybody doesn't like tripping over dark colored stuff in the middle of the. <laughs> yes. We have a guy that have a. a in any sort of party have their own uh, uh, eyepieces and he he having three different cases uh, actually he have 83 83 uh, eyepieces 80 <laughs> wow. yes yes yeah. that's more um, than i many, have in the many, warehouse <laughs> many of them yes yes i, I don't know if uh, yes uh, Many of them are uh, explore scientific. Yeah. Uh, but, <laughs> but, yes. Ale, Ale, mi saludos a Alejandro Varelli. His name is Alejandro Varelli. Uh, oh, tell us. Tell us. Yeah. Yeah, thank you very much. <laughs> yes. Really, because it, yes, he, he need really to protect his uh, uh, his investment because he used a very hard case. <laughs> uh, uh, for, I, I think yes, once you own any eyepiece. of our eyepieces, you're actually part owner. Uh, it, it, yes, uh, it's, it's yeah. amazing. It's um, very cool. Of course, that everybody go to the to the cases of Alejandro Varelli to to take, and he's very very a very good person. Because okay, use, but remember, to, <laughs> remember Bring to them back. <laughs> yeah, yes, yes, and yeah. the eyepieces in our third parties came from from the boxes from Alejandro Varelli. <laughs> and he know a lot, a lot of uh, optics. Really, I, I, I need to, to invite some somebody, another people from Argentina to the Cobble Sub Party, because I, I, I know people that, you know, that everywhere, maybe, maybe we, uh, in everywhere uh, you can find jewels, uh, 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 people that know a lot of things uh, everywhere in any country and, and it's, it's very interesting uh, from people that we can invite um, like well you know if you like I can share a few few pictures uh, of a dome that I construct yeah please okay, okay. This is one of my favorite domes that I made. Oh, wow. You made this dome? Yes, yes. Actually, um, I, I, am, I made uh, aluminum domes. Oh. Um, the, one of my favorite uh, domes was this one because it was for a tower in a hotel in Bariloche, in Patagonia, because it's a very, very windy uh windy place it's a it's a sky resort area yeah and i thought it make a very strong dome with more uh metal parts uh that actually made for example if i made something or i designed something for buenos aires it's not the same condition that this one that was for patagonia here is when we finish the, the dome and we put this in the track yeah. and, and start to, tra to, to traveling to Patagonia, 1,600 kilometers, maybe, wow. maybe 1,000 miles. Wow, that's far. Yes. Yes. And I, later I go, I, I fly to Patagonia to Bariloche, I received my dome in good conditions. No, yeah. but my dome, the, the, the dome for my customers, for the hotels. Yes. Sure. Um, we start to, to with the crane, with the crane started to... to um, how, how big is this dome? How many meters? No, only, no, 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 it's, it's a small. This was a small, it was only three, me three meters, no more. Okay. okay. This is a small one for for a uh, uh, for one eleven inches telescope. Okay. 
we, we put a 11 inch stereoscope in this system. Here's the crane. You have here, do you have the yes, the mound and snow? This was in October uh, 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. I don't know if today I support this, the stress of this. Wow. <laughs> when do you have wind in Patagonia? Look at this. This is a this is a home a part of the hotel in construction, but this would maybe you can see that this area is broken yeah. by the wind. By oh my goodness. No storm. Yes. When the people told me, oh this one, why is this? No, no, this is the, the last snowstorm last week. <laughs> okay. Jeez. So it's yeah. a very, uh, uh, very tough place to uh, build. Uh, yes, yes. Yeah. Uh, is it? Yeah. Bariloche is the most uh, popular sky area for ski area. Sorry, ski of skiing. Ski. Okay. So not the sky. Yes, yeah, the ski. Ski sorry. and sky. Um, yes. And sky. Yes. And this is the combination. And yeah. I, I took the picture. Um, uh, after, uh, before I received the dome in the, in the mm -hmm. tower, because yeah, this shadow is shadow. me. Yes, <laughs> this shadow. shadow is me taking the picture, and another guy. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> cool. Because we are waiting, you know, with the bolts to put so fast as possible to to to. Uh, to put was, was the wind the dome. was the yes. wind pushing the uh, dome? A little bit. Yes. Um, yeah. Yes. Yes. The, yes. We make all in the in the in the morning because at noon you yeah. can uh, feel how the wind is every time. Yeah. Uh, faster. Oh boy. Uh, yes. A few hours later, uh, a door in this area yeah. blow up by the wind. <laughs> Start to fly in. Yes. Yeah. Fortunately, we had the, the dome. Uh, you had it secured we, in time. Yes, here, yes, yes. That's cool. And here, yes. No, it looks very cool. It's finished, it's yes. Really nice. And, yeah. This is a guy is welding, not me. A, a guy that well, very well, not me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> because I work a lot in this dome, I remember, because um i well uh, 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 i will a lot of parts and we put uh, a change not um sometimes we use a different system but like uh we thought a, a lot of in ice and snow and wind we use a, a change a chain sorry my, my yes. translation um to have a, a very strong movements Without the problem, you know, with uh, about ice or another uh, another situation that that make your dome uh, unable to rotate. Mm -hmm. Really good because, idea. Yes, yes, you can break the the ice only with the motor because you, you don't have problem because here you have a. a a change like a change of the motorcycle or you know it's the same it's all chain all chain uh welded to the to the around the dome welded sorry sorry that i need english class when i today i i listen to the the, the english teacher okay and this is okay view of the dome yeah and actually, is how it was not actually because this is a picture of the same year that I made it, but uh, actually is is in the same place, and is still working with the telescope. Was that, was a great a, a great work because in a in a very hard conditions of uh, wind, snow, you know, was was uh, one of, of my favorite works in, uh, in domes, installations. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's excellent. It's nice. Of course, yeah. that only sometimes I made this because here in Argentina, the people don't have the 
all time <laughs> money to spend in this. But for we we made uh, a, a, a number of, of this, maybe near to 10, actually. I don't maybe in, in fiberglass because I don't know the techniques, but I, I, I am good. You can do it I'm, in metal. Uh, yes, yes, because I I am uh, I have in my my preparatory and my high school um, uh, uh, the technical school. And, sure. And, and my father is, is is a really really genius about this, and he teach me a lot of things. And normally when I I make this, I work yeah. with my father. I work it with my father. Actually, he have eighty two year eighty two years old. And he's oh, a cool. genius, and if, and today when I need something about mechanics, engineering, yeah. I told I told with my father Dante Brollo. It's, it's it's a genius, eighty two years old. This is the generation that you know everywhere in the United States or Argentina is the same. It's people that know everything, really. Yeah. Uh, well, they had to do everything. Yeah, <laughs> no. You had to do it all. I tried to learn. Yes. Yeah, that's good. That's very good. Yeah. Do, you, do you have your own observatory, Susan? No, really, really. I need to make you one of make this one for, for me. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Sure. Yes. 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 Mm -hmm. uh, this uh, this year, we had a, a really huge crisis because you know you know about uh, uh, economical crisis and well. Yeah. Actually, normally Argentinians move one year ahead our planes. Come on, yes. Um, maybe next year I can I can make my own observatory. My idea is make something remote because in Buenos Aires. But the idea is is make something with uh, with a dome, with a remote, extra yeah. scientific. <laughs> yes. Yeah. This guy Robert Denny can can give you some good advice on remote observatories. So yes, I yeah. I know that I have the best the best uh, stuff to, to talk. Right. <laughs> yeah, Jerry. Holt, I consider I a absolutely it, so. Jerry too. Yeah. Yes. That's right. <laughs> yes. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> absolutely, uh, I appreciate the, the any help into to this. There's lots of help. Um, uh, I think that in the future. Sure, and um, something that that uh, uh, um, I found that that the people can make a something that uh, about uh, the things that told that uh, talk, uh, talk just uh, Robert uh, Dennis is, is that every time the people can make their own remote observatories more affordable, more less less expensive because. You can make with this the, with the Yexus 100 perfectly. You can make a, a remote observatory. Yes, in a, you could. in a very small. Well, one of my ideas is made like a box, something like a box. Maybe we've, we've one got meter. one of those. We got yeah, one we of those have, stations one. at MSRO. We have a box That's, station like that. Sure. Yeah. Yes. Uh, yes. Can, one of my ideas is is make something like this because it's it's a it's a very interesting challenge make something small and put in in the place i have friends that that um have um, have uh, uh, their farms in mendoza or have uh, places where i can put an observatory very small and make remotely um, without problems let me show you uh i'm bringing up the facebook page for um this is Myron's little setup, right? For the Mark Slade Remote Observatory. Yeah. It's on our Facebook page. I want to show you, yeah, what what uh, what we what we've done here. What the heck? I'm I'm lost on this page anymore. I can't. Uh, <laughs> I'm I'm gonna bring up the photos album. Let me see. It's amazing. Online. Oh, here it is, right here. Um. There's a little box. Here it is. Really? Yes. That's a one meter box with a roll off little roof. 
and we've got the 102 on there. This is actually a CGE mount that we retrofit the yes. CMC8 system to. I, I repainted, I, uh, or yes, this is a list from Old Mount. Yeah, but we, we put the PMC8 motors and drive system on there. We replaced Excellent. the existing Excellent. one on there. Yes, because ha, this mount had a very good mechanics. Yeah. But the, the closed system of this was not so good. And if you put the PSM system, you have a, a, a great choice. So there's the, that's what the MSR looks like, the observatory. This is, this is yeah. what the... Uh, that's the it's one. It's amazing, Jerry. Amazing. Yeah. Oh, wow. And the last one. Yeah. Yeah. So that's what we have to play with. Yes. But that little box, we use that. That's station number three. We use it to train people on. We run it remotely every clear night, and it works great. Yes. And. and uh, encourage people to have to make this is it's amazing it will be amazing because uh, um, many people think that it's impossible but uh, today the, the, the possibilities are, are open are, are well uh, all about the the tall uh rubber about the, the all the things that you can make with ascom system the alpaca or you can connect everything is it's amazing uh, Jeff Wise is asking you, Jerry, uh, have you posted the plans for this observatory? Yeah. We've, we've got some documentation, not a whole lot. We could, we can um, really have, that. what that box is, you saw the, the, the aluminum uh, structure inside. That's actually one of those water tanks that Myron got from a friend. It's one of those portable water containers. Yeah. That's uh that he's got and uh cut it up and and put it in there but so Byron actually built another box before that uh which was just a small structure with the corrugated plastic panels as a siding type thing but there's a lot of different ways to build these small boxes anything you, you can design your own box to build uh, it's basically a one meter cube yeah, with with a roll off roof, um, and uh, yes, and you can carry to the your your uh, a friend in here. We talk, for example, Mendoza, which is in the west, and it's very very dry weather, and you have a very clear skies, and you can right. if you have a, a internet connection, um, it's it's great. Another design for that box is you could have a flip top lid, of course, that you just manually open. That's we we've talked about, or having it motorized too. But uh, that mo that particular box there has a lead screw, a long one meter yes. lead screw to open and close the the roof. Yes. Uh, the most critical thing is if you are if you don't are in in the place, is have a. a a trustable system that really open and really close if a bad weather is coming, you know. Right. If you have if you have somebody that can help you if you have problems, it's always okay. Yeah, this we're lucky to have Myron. He's hosting in his backyard. He's got a big backyard, so he hosts our observatory there. Uh, we yeah, got those cool. three stations. Yeah, excellent. Well, this is my, my, my project for next year. Yeah, you need an observatory. Yeah, we absolutely. All need one. Yes. The balcony is okay, but come on. We don't yeah. need a balcony uh, anymore. You need a balcony too. Uh, yes, yes. Really, really was in, in the time of pandemic here was really fun. And oh, yeah. in, a, in this time of the, not in this time of the year, but um, I, I have from the balcony uh, uh, in, in winter, I have a, a part of the sky fully of, uh, you know, the, I have the Milky Way, of course, and we don't see the Milky Way in Buenos Aires, but this is full of objects to, to take pictures. And I have pictures of, of uh, yeah, you Lago photographed Nebula the here, and I have a lot of Bye, pictures Bob. from take here. Bye-bye. 
is really. Oh, I was waving to Deepti because she messaged me. Uh, oh, okay. <laughs> ah, oh, okay. On Facebook. Sorry. So, hello. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. I think we all want to be part of your club, Deepti. So, yes. Yeah, we all want to be members. Yes, indeed. It's great for us. <laughs> I have to look down to type, so I'm kind of messed up that way. That's all right. <laughs> It's not for that. <laughs> I need to move my camera down here. Like Jason, he has his low, and I think that's much better. All right. Here. Well, does anybody else have anything that they would like to share? And we're kind of towards. Sun, you want to see the sunspot from yesterday? Of course. Uh, yeah. Of course we do. I just stacked it up. <laughs> Oh, wow. oh, oh nice. my gosh. Nice. Come on. <laughs> Whoa. Yeah, that's really nice. That's fantastic. Yeah. Come Look on. at that. Um, you see that big pillar come out of the, the left? Yeah, that, that, that looks that's like a out giant of this world. finger coming out. Or this, uh, yeah, I think that's a giant plasma finger actually sticking yeah. out above yeah. the surface. This is, for to, this is from today. Uh, this was yesterday. Yes. Oh, no, sorry. No, no. Yesterday here. Yesterday too. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, absolutely fantastic. So is this is the dark part of this like shadow or? What, the it can't be spot? shadow. I mean, what what is it? Why is yeah, it? It's just uh, cooler. It's a uh, it's a cooler. This yeah, okay. the sunspots are cooler. I mean, that's, it looks like this shaft is coming out. You know, so. Mm hmm. Amazing. I suppose once it gets up. Yeah, you can kind of get lost I in there. Saw, you just look I at look at certain I'm spots and then the, yeah. these things. So that was taken over the span of um, probably about an hour, hour and 15 minutes. That was taken a frame of just under every minute. I ended up taking, getting 90 frames here. Look at that. It looks like running water, running like yeah, any different and, directions, you know? And only in one hour, it's so fast. Because if you consider the, the, the size of this, it's, it's incredibly fast. The energy is, is Unbelievable. It's impossible yeah, I mean, to the, have all a, the a scale of this. The, the fields of, of, you know, the sunspot's yeah. got to be the size of the Earth, right? Yeah, it's about the size of the Earth, the dark spot. Yeah. So like, the like big uh, one Caesar is said, it moves fast. I mean, look how fast the stuff moves a distance of the Earth in an hour, yeah. you know? It's like... Yeah. This is one hour. Wow. Yeah, I could actually tell you for sure here. Let me look it up. I got it on my other computer here. Can... You can totally see the magnetic fields. It's just... Yeah. it's. I don't know, you remember when you were kids, you'd put a bar magnet down on a piece of paper and put iron filings on there and yeah, visualize right. it. I mean, that's kind of the same thing. So this was shot from uh, 1817 to Somebody's 19, asking, 1954. Uh, so it's an hour and a half. Color. Yep. An hour and a half. An hour and a half. Okay. Awesome. Beautiful. Yep. Is this uh, is this inverted color? No, this is this is just natural. Natural. Yeah, but a lot of times I'll do the the solar stuff in inverted color just because it helps the the uh, texture stand out. But it really yeah. looks weird when you've got a sunspot in there because when you invert it, <laughs> the center of the sunspots end up bright. Very bright. Yeah. Beautiful. So That's the dark, you know, the dark structures you see there is actually the, the chromosphere. So it's the hydrogen plasma tendrils over top of the, the surface. Mm -hmm. They're a little bit cooler than the, or I don't know actually if they are cooler, but they're not as bright as the photosphere below. So they're kind of silhouetted against the photosphere. 
When I was the at the uh, 91 eclipse, uh, I was in, in Mauna Kea, and I was working with the Nova film crew there. But the, they had a professional uh, French team that was at the CFHT where we were set up. And uh, they had, uh, they were after trying to explain the connection, you know, because the, the, the sun heats up to like, I think like over a million degrees or something uh, as, it, as it gets from what, you know, what we would have called the surface of the sun you know the the and they were trying to find out why you know as as it, as the you know as you got up into the higher atmospheres why it was getting so superheated you know what was the action there so i don't know that they understand that even today that's why the solar yeah. parker solar probe is going down there to check it out Right. You know, I thought that was pretty neat. I just. Uh, just That's very neat. Very cool. I mean, very hot. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That was, you know, I'm, the scene was excellent yesterday, and oh yeah, it really, uh, really makes that day to shine. You've got the good uh, still atmosphere to shoot through. That's very cool. Yeah, I can for every good example like this, I can I can point to several where the atmosphere just destroys the image. Mm -hmm. well, it's wonderful to see the these these kind of uh, magic moments here. So that's really cool. It's really good. Yeah. You sound <laughs> like a you sound like a Kodak commercial. These magic moments. <laughs> oh, we, so we are going to get a song. That's my song right there. Yeah, okay. I have one-liner songs. <laughs> yep. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you, everybody. Thanks for, thanks for coming together again. Um, uh, we have uh, on our daily show coming up, on Thursday, we have uh, Andrew Fracknoy is going to join us. Um, uh, he's, he'll be talking about a couple of subjects, so he'll be on on Thursday, and then I think he comes back again on Monday. Um, uh, so we have our daily shows at four o'clock, four p.m. Central, um, and we have a lineup of other people that'll be joining us as well. So uh, tune in, and uh, we'll be back with another Global Star Party. I'm I don't think this this Friday, unless uh, Gary Palmer hits me back up uh, to say, hey, Scott, we're going to do a, a Friday night <laughs> global star party. Um, I can't wait to do another Asian uh, Asia edition of the global star party. It was really, really great. Uh, DT participated in that as well. Oh, nice. So that that is getting a, a tremendous traffic uh, still. Um, and uh well it's just an honor to be here with you guys so thank you very much and uh we'll let uh caesar what time is it getting to be uh, um one uh, uh, one for the a yeah oh. a.m of course it's early for you yeah i know you'll hey. go go and make a nice pizza and uh <laughs> <laughs> Yes, for, Actually, for the, I can hardly wait to get down. Yes, there. I'm especially come down for, for and the, I, want a, I want a pizza and yeah, uh, yeah. look at some really dark skies and I, I, I made this for in the European edition. Yes, I yes. I, 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 I I put my Italian as accents. It's great. It's yes, great. it was great. Yes, yes. All right. Well, uh, we are going to call it a night. Um, I think I will play. Um, I have another little feature video to play for you guys, and there'll be some ending credits. Uh, but thank you so much. And uh, yeah, let's... thanks everybody for uh, being here. I appreciate it. Yeah, that thank too. you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, awesome. Good times. Oh, it's good Congratulations times. Congratulations to everyone. So really great. Yeah. Really thank great. you so much. Yeah. Thanks for coming on, Bob. 
and we'll uh, come out. I loved it. Yeah, me too. Take care. Thanks for having us. Thanks. Thank you, Richard. Bye. Good night. Bye. 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 Okay. Let's... The human exploration of space, still in its infancy. The Apollo missions were just the first step in our goal to have astronauts working on the surface of worlds beyond our own. And as NASA plans its return of humans to the moon and eventually onto Mars, a team of scientists have come together to test and build some of the tools our future explorers may use on these journeys. Based out of NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center in Greenbelt, Maryland, this group is called the Goddard Instrument Field Team, otherwise known as GIFT. The scientists in GIFT collect data on some of the most unique terrains on Earth, such as glaciers in Iceland, lava tubes in Hawaii, mar craters in New Mexico, and the desert regions of Chile. The goal is to conduct field research in geologic settings that share similarities to locations on other planets, moons, and even asteroids. Scientists call these sites planetary analogs as they help us learn how to interpret data from across the solar system while also getting a better understanding of Earth. In these environments, GIFT researchers test both commercial and newly developed scientific equipment. These are portable devices that could be used by astronauts or used aboard future rovers or other types of spacecraft. These field instruments are capable of multiple types of analysis, with some providing instantaneous feedback. The team uses devices that can observe and characterize the landscape around a user, as well as ones that analyze the chemical composition and physical properties of materials found at and below the surface. The team also works with instruments that measure aerosols in the atmosphere, magnetic fields, and solar radiation. No matter which field campaign they are on, the scientists in GIFT are selecting and using their instruments to answer high-priority science questions. And to more fully capture the essence of how humans would explore the surface of the Moon or Mars, GIFT members also simulate astronaut EVAs, or extravehicular activities, at the planetary analogs they study. Both former and current astronauts have accompanied GIFT on these simulations. Overall, the Goddard Instrument Field Team provides a unique resource to NASA and the external science community by combining the studies of planetary science, Earth science, and hardware technology. All of the tests, experiments, and data collected provide a blueprint for the human exploration of other worlds. And that's a great gift for those taking the next giant leap.
Thank you.